Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of iPerformance Graphics Conference 2022. Um, we're going to start today by uh, with a short um, presentation by one of our sponsors, Meta Reality Labs. Hi, I'm Larry Seiler. I'm a research scientist in Meta's Reality Labs Graphics Research Group. Reality Labs is the Meta division that works on virtual and augmented reality as well as related products. But instead of talking about our research, I'm going to talk about what it's all for. Five years ago, I attended HPG and learned that Facebook had a position for a GPU architect. Warren Hunt wanted his graphics research group to develop a new kind of graphics processor dedicated to the needs of an augmented reality headset. I had one key question for Warren. Why is the social media company getting involved with virtual and augmented reality? Warren told me that Facebook wasn't just a social media company. Facebook's mission, he said, was to connect people over distance. Virtual and augmented reality would dramatically increase that connection, so they were central to the company's mission. Our name change last fall to Meta Platforms made that mission very public. But the metaverse is not just about VR and AR. It's a virtual world where people can connect using PCs, cell phones, or more specialized equipment. An example is the Meta Portal, which is a smart video conference device. I use it as my primary screen for meetings, since it's so much simpler than conferencing software. I also use Portal to talk with my 96-year-old mother, who lives in South Dakota. She is very hard of hearing and gave up on, on telephones years ago. But she can understand it's using the Portal because she can see our faces and lips. And using it is simple. She, or one of the nurses, just says, uh, Hey Portal, call Larry, and it makes the connection. Its smart camera even zooms in on faces, so you don't have to aim it. Connecting people over distance. Meta also worked with Ray-Ban to produce the Stories line of smart glasses. They let you take first-person pictures and videos and share them on social media. They also allow listening to music and making hands-free calls using voice commands. They're like an AR headset minus the video display. <coughs> the next step is 3D telepresence. Meta is doing a lot of research on realistic avatars, but that's for the future. Using Quest 2, it's possible to meet people in VR environments using simple customizable 3D avatars. My subgroup of the graphics team has five people who live in three different states, so we decided to try it, and we were delighted at how well it worked. Now, teleconferencing works okay for one-on-ones or one person talking to many, but when there's lots of people on the call, I often can't tell who's talking. And if some people join from a meeting room, I usually can't even see their faces in that little window. But with Quest's 3D audio, I could immediately tell who was talking, and, and I could turn and look at them and see them speaking to me. And we could write on virtual desks to share drawings with each other. It works uh, so much better than uh, clunky shared whiteboard interfaces, connecting people over distance. It worked so well <laughs> that we played virtual miniature golf together after the meeting. Well, that's the present. What of the future? Our goal in Reality Labs research is to make all-day wearable AR glasses practical. To be comfortable, they must be lightweight and very low power so they don't get hot. There's a lot of technology to invent in order to make that happen. We need headset graphics processors that use less than a tenth of a watt and render objects that we can interact with as if they are real. We need to compensate for body motion and interact with graphics processing in the cloud as well as solving many other problems unrelated to graphics. Michael Labrash, the head of Reality Labs Research, has groups working on all of these areas. Now, <laughs> computer graphics is a lot of fun, and that's what led me into this field. But whether we work in industry or academia, we have to justify why our work is worth doing. Smartphones changed the world, as did PCs before them, and in both cases, computer graphics were a key reason why. I believe that practical AR glasses will change the world as well, and that graphics is key to making that happen. So at Meta, <laughs> I, know why my work, I know why my work is worth doing. Our graphics research is helping to make all-day wearable AR glasses a reality, and that will help to better connect people over distance. Hello everyone, and welcome to the second keynote of HPG 2022. 
My name is Tammy Bubaker from Adobe Research, and it's my pleasure to welcome for this uh, second keynote Shweb Kamil, who is a principal research scientist who leads the Programming Language and Performance Group in the Computational Creativity Lab at Adobe Research. His main areas of focus include compilers, computer-assisted programming, and high-performance computing. Prior to joining Adobe, he worked at MIT and at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and obtained his PhD in computer science from uh, Berkeley. The talk today is entitled Toward Computer Assisted High Performance for Graphics. Shoeb, up to you. Thank you, Tammy. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, the committee and everybody for inviting me uh, for this talk. Uh, it is uh, always somewhat of a strange experience to give a talk in a virtual environment, particularly because I can see nobody's reactions. So hopefully people will have great questions um, at the end of the session. So thank you. Um, I wanted to start by first adding a towards to the title of my talk, because I think a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is um, initial research that we've done in different areas of computer assisted high performance um, and some open challenges when it comes to graphics. So to begin with, I'm sure you have all seen this or similar charts. Um, if we look at hardware performance improvements for CPUs in the past, uh, 50 years, um, we can see that the single-threaded performance, which is in blue, has been increasing, um, but has started to level off. And instead, what hardware manufacturers have begun doing is increasing the number of logical cores. So really, the performance that you can obtain is the multiplication of these two, which is maybe better charted on a, a chart like this, um, which is from Lyserson. And so here we're just looking at spec int, which is, you know, admittedly a really artificial benchmark um, and the performance thereof. And if you kind of follow the curve here, you can see that we, for the most part, have been able to continue scaling hardware performance by taking advantage of multi-threaded CPUs. Um, similarly, you know, if you look at performance of uh, GPUs, these have continued to increase steadily um, in the past years. However, I think all of us can attest to writing high performance software is not necessarily uh, gaining the same kinds of uh, improvements. So we're basically trying to write uh, high performance software with primitive tools. And that's not to dismiss the huge advantages of languages like CUDA, which have made it possible to take advantage of GPUs for general uh, programming. But it is the case that uh, we're making hardware much faster and much more powerful. But for the most part, the driver of this increased use of uh, compute is really machine learning. So I am going to mostly not talk about uh, machine learning in this talk. Um, I think there's many more qualified people who can say a lot more about that. But one of the successes for machine learning really is uh, leveraging the massive amounts of compute that um, are available today. The rest of us, you know, we've had some advantages, like I said, from things like CUDA. We also have better static analysis tools, which kind of run in the background if you use Xcode or Visual Studio Code. You know, you get some semantic highlighting now, which is indeed a big uh, improvement over the uh, previous state of having to just continually run the compiler to tell you the error messages. But for the most part, I would argue that we don't really have the same advantages as hardware has increased its performance. Writing software for that hardware has not gotten much easier. So. A big thrust of the research that I work on and my group at Adobe works on is computer-aided programming. And our goal here is to harness the power of hardware um, in order to make it easier to write high-performance code. 
And today I'm go going to kind of talk about that in terms of a toolbox of techniques. Um, I'm going to talk about scheduling languages, program synthesis, and sparsity-specific specialization as three manifestations of the way we can use increased hardware uh, compute ability to make programming more efficient um, and more uh, productive. So let's start with scheduling languages. Um, the key here is that manually writing fast code is truly tedious. So if you have something like a three by three box filter, which is probably code you've seen uh, dozens of times if you've done any image processing, writing the straightforward code is fairly easy, but turning it into fast code re requires manually applying multiple different optimizations, each of which interact with one another in non-trivial ways. So this is just a three by three box blur. You know, you take this image uh, of a parrot and you blur it. Uh, really simple algorithm. But to actually make this run fast, you have to transform this into this relatively gobbledygook amount of code, which applies tiling, vectorization, um, you know, stores intermediates more efficiently by tile rather than uh, computing an entire intermediate image. And all of the math, um, all of the loop bounds, all of the transformations here are incredibly tedious for programmers to write. So I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard about uh, Halide, the language for dense computations that was um, uh, initially uh, published in 2012. Um, this is work by Jonathan Reagan Kelly and Andrew Adams and a bunch of others. But basically the idea here is that you define the computation without really thinking about or defining how that computation occurs. And then separately, you schedule the computation using a second scheduling language. And in this language, you specify how the intermediate data are stored, the order of computation, whether you compute on CPUs with vectorization and in parallel, or whether you compute on GPUs, or whether you use a combination of those, whether you store things in shared memory, you know, what is the tile size for your GPU loops, and so on. The key idea here is that separating out these two allows one to explore different optimizations without needing to rewrite the algorithm. So in the previous example, each time I applied a uh, optimization, I would essentially have to rewrite the entire loop nest. Um, the key idea with scheduling languages is that the programmer can simply change a few lines that specify how the computation occurs, and the compiler takes care of mapping that to the actual hardware based on the constructs that the programmer specified. So what this really enables is that the compiler only needs to ensure that the transformation is valid, not whether it will pay off. In traditional compilers, what we really have is a large set of um, mostly handwritten um, heuristics that decide whether a particular transformation will pay off. And these heuristics perform poorly when you have when you need to apply a combination of transformations. So applying transformation A in isolation might not be profitable, and transformation B in isolation may not be profitable. But applying the com combination of those can be. So really what scheduling languages are doing here is removing the need for the compiler to decide whether a particular optimization will pay off or not. And instead, it orthogonalizes these concerns. That allows humans to concentrate on exploring optimizations once they've gotten their algorithm correct. Um, instead of rewriting the code over and over, they can quickly try you know, executing on a GPU, applying vectorization, you know, deciding to do it to, to uh, compute intermediates and tiles and so on. The other thing that this enables is that it allows us to, by orthogonalizing the problem, it allows us to assist programmers by building auto schedulers. And there's a rich uh, set of papers in this uh, area um, 
you know, including uh, a couple papers from uh, Andrew Adams and uh, uh, a couple uh, collaborators. Uh, this is from Mullah Pudi. Uh, what this really chart, what this chart is really showing here is the time it takes for two expert programmers to actually explore a large set of optimizations and um, to see how that pays off in terms of the throughput of the uh, code that they created. So if you look at the time scale on the x-axis here, what you're seeing here is minutes. And I would argue for these kinds of algorithms, if one were to write this by hand, um, these would be, the x-axis here would have to be days um, or at least, at the very least, hours rather than uh, minutes. But very quickly, you know, an expert programmer like um, Andrew Adams here or Dylan Charlotte, um, they can quickly explore a large space and, and, you know, increase performance by orders of magnitude. Now, when it comes particularly for uh, simulation, which, you know, is a big area of interest uh, in graphics, I think we've had numerous attempts for various different kinds of uh, simulation. Um, you know, every year there's one or two uh, languages that um, get published in venues like TOG or SIGGRAPH or HPG. Um, and these all are uh, fairly interesting, but none of them can really support the cross product of the simulation algorithm the data structure and the scheduling options based on that data structure and and simulation algorithm. Um, so in this sense, in, in one sense, one could say that you know we're still kind of exploring what is the halide of simulation, and part of that is simply because there is a huge diversity of simulation algorithm. There's a huge diversity of data structure, and given those, you end up with a massive scheduling space. Towards that, um, the Tensor Algebra Compiler, or TACO, um, really tries to think about the low-level operations that are common across many of these simulation algorithms. So this really takes care of you know, sparse and dense tensor algebra. However, it does not support some of the fundamental building blocks, such as direct solves or optimization, um, which continue to be open problems in uh, scheduling languages. So for this particular tool, I think we have a lot of great evidence that it that we can orthogonalize the problem and make it easier for programmers to uh, efficiently write high performance code. But we still don't have some kind of holy grail that works across um, multiple domains where data is not necessarily just uh, operations on dense tensors. The second tool that I want to talk about here um, is called program synthesis. And program synthesis, I'm going to motivate by looking at the problem of legacy optimized code. Um, so one of the problems that having ma manually optimized code um, introduces is that if you look at this code, it's not immediately obvi obvious what the code actually does. And large long-lived applications such as those created by Adobe um, do suffer from bit rot. We have a large legacy of optimizing code. And um, in many cases, the original authors that optimize that code are no longer available. The uh, hardware has moved on. Um, and even in some cases, the original authors of the algorithms may not even remember why they applied a particular optimization. So in order to take advantage of the scheduling language that I showed before, we really want to rewrite this code into domain-specific languages, or we want to at least, you know, get the optimized code down to its most basic set of loops so that the algorithm is understandable and we can try to understand how to optimize for modern hardware like GPUs um, and vectorized multi-threaded CPUs. 
So, I mean, if you didn't know what this piece of code that I showed earlier did, I think it would be quite confusing and difficult to, at a glance, uh, try to understand what this code is trying to do. You have a bunch of intrinsics. Um, you have uh, a lot of math computing sizes of uh, tiles. Luckily, in this case, we have a few comments. But often, legacy code does not contain any comments, and you just have a large set of spaghetti that you're trying to unravel to try to understand what a particular piece of code does and whether it can be computed more efficiently. So for that, we uh, worked on this tool called Dexter, which the key idea here in Dexter is that we want to be able to take this highly optimized code, run it through a program that automatically deciphers what is this code in its most simple declarative form. And because our domain is image processing, we of course chose Halide as the output language um, because it makes it quite easy uh, to see this, to, to see the semantics of the underlying code when you have it written out in this uh, declarative fashion. And then we can do things like manually schedule that code for new hardware or throw the auto scheduling machinery at it so that um, we can you know, automatically come up with faster schedules and faster ways to uh, perform that computation. So Dexter primarily works using this search process uh, that consists of three, three parts. You have a search space that is defined by a grammar. So this is really a syntactic search space. Um, this is things like, you know, uh, our grammar, it, you know, contains things like plus and multiply and, you know, variables and memory accesses and so on. And then we have a search algorithm. And the combination of those two generates a proposed program that, that then gets passed to an equivalence checker that tries to check whether the uh, proposed program is semantically equivalent to the original program. That is, for all possible inputs, are the outputs the same? So conceptually, this is quite a simple thing. But how do we actually check equivalence? And how do we guide the search? Um, the search space, if you think about image processing, the search space really consists of any possible image processing program one could write. So that is far too large. Um, starting with the equivalence check piece, the program synthesizer checks equi equivalence by encoding the semantics of the proposed solution. Uh, and then we pass that to a uh, SMT solver, which is basically like a SAT solver with lots of machinery above it that kind of understands things that are not just Boolean, um, uh, Boolean expressions. And this SMT solver checks whether the semantics are equivalent using a very um, uh, difficult algorithm, let's say. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And it either uh, returns back, yes, for all inputs, so these are equivalent. The pr that is, the proposed program is equivalent to the input program. Or it returns a set of counterexample inputs. So these counterexample inputs are the key for making our search efficient. The search algorithm takes into account all of the counterexample inputs seen so far and tries to construct a solution that applies just for those counterexample uh, inputs. And in doing so, um, we create this cycle, right? We create um, a proposed program, then the equivalence checker gives us some counterexamples. We pass those back to the search process, which then proposes a new program. Um, this algorithm is called counterexample guided inductive synthesis, or CGIS. Um, and there is a pretty rich history of applying this to a bunch of different domains. And for Dexter, we applied it to image processing. 
So you might be thinking, what is the difference between program synthesis and you know machine learning in kind of our convolutional neural network sense where we have stochastic gradient descent doing the search? Um, the major difference is that synthesis is guided by counterexamples. There's no gradient. So you kind of don't have a direction where you are guaranteed to make progress. Um, in addition, the criteria generally is uh, absolute correctness for program synthesis. That is, for every possible input, the outputs need to be exactly the same rather than uh, you know, minimizing some quantity that uh, is common in stoch stochastic gradient descent. Um, and lastly, synthesis searches over a syntax generated by uh, a grammar, whereas SGD is adjusting weights within a fixed neural network. So the sum total of all of this is that the uh, program synthesis is a fairly heavyweight tool when you're trying to ensure that the semantics are exactly the same. Um, and that makes it difficult to really apply in cases where you're trying to find approximate um, equivalence. So what does program synthesis enable in Dexter? We applied it to a corpus of 353 performance critical functions from Photoshop. Uh, these were functions, some of which had been hand optimized to use SSE intrinsics and AVX intrinsics. Others were just complicated pieces of code that were hundreds of lines um, and, you know, with little to no uh, commentary dictating or uh, showing, you know, what those uh, pieces of code did. Of those, Dexter was able to translate 264 or 74.7% .7 successfully automatically. Um, the total compile time here was 200 hours on 60 cores. Uh, as you can see, this is a fairly <laughs> heavyweight uh, piece of machinery to run. Um, however, even given that, I would say that in terms of the programmer effort to translate 353 performance critical image processing functions, um, I would call it a huge win. Uh, saving 200 hours is, is pretty great. So what happened uh, for the ones that we were not able to translate? So 57% of those were just due to our prototype not supporting all C++ features. Uh, you know, some of these things um, used structs and you know other kinds of uh, C++ isms that our uh, fairly simple uh, C++ parser couldn't really deal with. Um, and 43% timed out because the synthesis problem was too hard. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a couple slides, but that's kind of fundamentally the uh, difficult difficulty of uh, applying program synthesis is that really most of the work in building Dexter was trying to figure out how do we scale program synthesis up to uh, being able to handle real world uh, image processing code. So what we did with the, with these uh, translated functions was then to apply a really simple and fairly generic um, schedule to that. Uh, we just decided, let's parallelize the outermost loop. So let's parallelize across uh, chunks of rows and let's vectorize the innermost loop um, for all of these image processing algorithms. Um, and to do so, we utilized Halide and we targeted an AVX2 uh, capable machine. And if you look at this chart, what you see is the speed up relative to the uh, input code. And that input code had mostly been uh, hand optimized for um, SSE2 or you know, was relying on automatic 
uh, general compiler optimizations. Something like 70% of the uh, uh, translated functions were faster than the original ones. Um, there were some that were slower for various reasons. Some of these were uh, glorified versions of memcopy. So uh, really we should you know, just be using memcopy in some of those cases. Um, others uh, that were slower just had um, complex uh, uh, indexing arithmetic that we could probably do a better job of translating. Um, but the geometric mean of speed up here is 3.36. And again, essentially by uh, automatically applying this tool, we not only get the output declarative uh, version of the algorithm, but we also can uh, apply these schedules and automatically get faster um, performance. So a subset of these are in fact shipping in Photoshop today. So this is a rare example of a programming language tool that actually um, impacts uh, a product by uh, speeding things up automatically and then you know, translating that to uh, actual user experience in, 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 the, in the real world. So program synthesis has a bunch of limitations and open problems. So like I said before, depending on the semantics, proving equivalence can be intractably hard. Um, and in, in fact, it in some cases boils down to the halting problem. So we know that even theoretically, we won't be able to synthesize everything. Um, even for the subset of uh, semantics that we supported in Dexter, it is far harder than NP hard. Uh, you know, this is like in P space star, um, which is a much more difficult uh, uh, equivalence class of, pro of uh, difficulty. Um, and the other aspect that's really, really difficult, I think, for the HPG audience to, to understand, for, for us to keep in mind, um, is that floating point operations are really difficult to synthesize. So that makes it really hard for a lot of the problems that in graphics that we're really interested in um, to apply this technology. We're continuing to work on trying to make floating point operations easier to synthesize, but basically, you know, you essentially have a field uh, that's 16 or 32 bits wide, and the operations really are complicated to reason about, particularly things like divisions. Um, the other aspect is that in high-performance graphics, a lot of our problems are amenable to approximation. So approximate synthesis is an area where there's a lot of research happening. Uh, it's still fairly new, um, and the techniques are fairly limited. Um, but the other thing that people try to do is just use ML-based techniques because um, you know when approximation is appropriate, you can often get better approximations um, using machine learning than trying to uh, synthesize a approximate algorithm. And so perhaps one day there will be a way to unify some of these techniques. Um, I'm going to uh, point out a paper uh, that will be in SIGGRAPH 2022 uh, later in this talk that might be of interest to people who want to see kind of where that um, area is going. Um, I think, Bernd, that's a great question. Um, so we did not attempt to convert um, Halide back to C++. Uh, basically, Halide is embedded in C++, so what you are getting is C++ code that uses libhalide um, as a compiler. But what, what, what one thing that that compiler does support is to actually output code back to C++. So halide itself can actually generate C++ code. Um, we did not actually try to utilize that capability, uh, but I think that's a good question. My suspicion is that it would dr differ drastically from the hand-optimized versions, um, simply because those hand-optimized versions mostly are written using a uh, 
mix of SSE intrinsics and um, and uh, a bunch of preprocessor directives. That's what the original code looks like. Um, the output code would instead rely more on structures that, uh, or data types, I should say, that are supported by LLVM and um, Clang, as well as GCC to better express vector operations in C++. So the code itself looks quite different. I think fundamentally, some of the optimizations would be the same, you know, perhaps with different tile sizes and with different vectorization length, lengths. So the last tool I'm going to talk about here is kind of in, you know, the, uh, also the vein of applying uh, a lot of compute at compile time. And that's sparsity specific specialization. Um, and that really applies for sparse computations. So I know that uh, coming from the simulation world before I was at Adobe, I had a career where I was working for the Department of Energy um, on all, you know, all kinds of simulations uh, in high performance computing. Um, we like to think of the world as sparse. The connectivity of things is just not dense. So in order to represent that and to compute on the world, um, we often use sparse matrices. And you know, here's a, an example of a sparse matrix that um, I believe uh, represents uh, part of uh, a simulation that happens on a surface of a wing. The behavior of the underlying computation depends really on the structure of this matrix. So that makes sense because the sparse matrix is really representing the connectivity of the world, which really doesn't have everything you know, directly connected to everything else. Um, so the non-zero structure or the connectivity of the thing you're representing really um, dictates how simulation occurs. A lot of codes structure, you know, leverage this structure to avoid unnecessary uh, complexity in the code and unnecessary computation. For example, you can represent convolutions as sparse matrices, but often people just do it directly because that way, you know, you can avoid a lot of the computation. In many cases, the convolution uh, is a image filter, for example, so you know the the weights. Um, and that makes it easy to express as code rather than expressing as uh, uh, sparse matrix operations in which you have to load those weights. So what sparsity specific specialization really is asking is kind of the dumb question of what if we compile the code separately for each sparse matrix? The idea here is that we want to expend a lot of effort at compile time to save time during the actual computation. Um, and some initial work in this area uh, we published in SGP in 2020, um, we took the Eigen API and we basically compile, compile it into vectorized CPU code for a specific sparsity structure. So this isn't quite uh, making it so that we're compiling for a specific sparse matrix, but we are compiling for that specific sparse matrix structure. If we change any of the values, that's okay. But if we change the locations of those values, then we have to recompile the code. And that actually applies to several areas in simulation and uh, you know other uh, domains where we may be using the same, same sparse uh, matrix structure repeatedly to perform computations. Um, there will be a follow-on work um, at SIGGRAPH 2022, where uh, Philip Pearls and some more collaborators um, apply the same techniques to generate fast GPU code and also scale up um, the size of matrices we can handle um, and get even better performance than our 2020 paper. Um, in another vein, 
um, Simpiler, which was uh, at supercomputing in 2017, tries to generate solver code for a specific matrix structure. So this, you know, is really about direct solves for the most part, uh, although, you know, we do support some iterative solves in this uh, uh, library. But the idea there is that for most direct solves, there is a phase of doing analysis on the matrix structure before actually executing it. What Simpiler does is to actually take that uh, uh, analysis phase and generate code that is specific to that matrix, matrix's uh, structure. So let me give a cartoon example of what sparsity specific specialization looks like. Um, suppose we have this really small sparse matrix and we're doing this sparse matrix vector multiply. Um, the red here are non-zeros and the grays are zeros. If we write this as a dense loop, you know, it just looks like a couple nested loops. We have some index calculation, uh, but there's a bunch of wasted work. Uh, we don't need to do the uh, multiply by zeros. So what people often often do is to write it, you know, as a sparse computation. You change the data structure. Now in this uh, case, we have uh, a, an array ii, which contains the um, I locations of each non-zero and a array JJ, which contains the J locations of every non-zero and AVALS contains the value at that non-zero in the sparse matrix. Um, so what sparsity specific specialization really does is think about um, semantically, what is the computation at each output location? So in this case, we can actually symbolically um, figure out what is the output computation, and then we generate code that is exactly that symbolic uh, computation. This allows us to store the uh, values densely and to not really worry about the indices and avoid the indirection that you get in the um, sparse uh, case. Now, of course, the truth is, if you actually wrote that, generated that code, it would be extremely slow because all we've done is move the problem from loading data values to loading code that contains those data values. So that is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. Um, instead, what we want to do is find clever ways of grouping that code um, so that we can transform it into a set of loops um, that efficiently compute. The way we do this in at eggs is to aggregate expression trees um, with the uh, with abstract data. So what I mean by that is, for example, we take every case where we have a tree where the output is the addition of two multiplications of values, some coming from the um, matrix and some coming from the vector. And we aggregate all those into a bunch of loops over similar trees that are then vectorized. What this enables us to do is to actually output code that is much faster than general uh, computation on sparse data. Um, here I'm showing a three different um, linear algebra expressions. Um, that we uh, compare our performance of eggs against writing that code in MKL, which is you know, the fastest sparse library really around. Um, and what we see here is that we can obtain speedups of almost 4x um, by avoiding redundant computation. I think this is especially uh, uh, clear in cases where you're multiplying sparse matrices because your intermediates may have, have entries that then end up being zeros. And if we symbolically uh, uh, analyze the output at compile time, we can avoid computing with those zeros for our intermediates. I would say that for the most part, the savings here come from two different places. 
One is saving in memory bandwidth because we're loading fewer indices, um, we're avoiding redundant work, and the other is uh, also uh, from uh, more efficient compute. Uh, mostly that is just not computing things that we're not going to store. So with many collaborators, we've um, published a series of paper, papers I think that would be interest, of interest to uh, the, uh, the uh, HPG community. Um, the, this includes applying um, the eggs technique to uh, GPUs, which uh, will be presented in SIGGRAPH in just about a month, um, as well as a series of papers um, that were at supercomputing and at SIGGRAPH, where we apply these techniques to create um, faster sparse matrix solves and faster uh, QP solves. Um, and the results of these are open source and um, available uh, really easily if you simply um, search NASA Akron Parsi and the, prime, the first author, uh, Kazim Cheshmi, um, who uh, was a PhD student at the University of Toronto. To end with, I'm going to kind of outline a few further directions um, for this general application of compute power to making um, programming faster. The first thing that I alluded to earlier is how do we combine really the nice parts of program synthesis, which really does well for domain-specific building blocks, um, along with stochastic search. And in this vein, uh, Karima Ma, who was an intern at uh, Adobe when she started this work um, and is uh, a student at MIT, uh, will be presenting a paper at SIGGRAPH um, in a month or so, which really shows the application of uh, a kind of program synthesis, which is kind of the uh, most basic thing, which is randomly search over programs, um, combined with stochastic search for um, optimizing each of those programs for a particular algorithm. Um, in this case, what we did was to um, look at existing demosaicing algorithms and try to extract what are kind of domain specific building blocks from the non machine learning versions of those demosaicing algorithms and combine those with machine learning building blocks um, into a large search that um, searches both over the overall program structure as well as the weights um, for, uh, for optimizing that for this particular uh, problem. So I think that's going to be a really great talk. Uh, you should definitely attend and, and uh, listen to it. Um, another spiel that I want to put out here is just that in everything I've talked about so far, it really is a matter of throwing more compute power to the programming and compilation side of things. Um, the scheduling language aspect, though, is really also talking about programmer efficiency. In that vein, I also want to uh, point out another area of really exciting research um, that I've been lucky to be involved with, which is revisiting program language syntax. Now, mostly PL research has been ignoring syntax for years and years, kind of really treating it as like, well, it doesn't really matter. What's really interesting is the semantics of different languages, because that's how programmers really have to think about the code. Um, I want to argue for a uh, renaissance of syntax, because I really do think that we've ignored some of the convenience of syntax. Um, for example, when it comes to markup, uh, Markdown has really simple and intuitive syntax that makes it easy to write Markdown code and have that get translated to um, HTML and you know other uh, other outputs for presentation. Um, anyone who has has you know tried to draft math, for example, uh, I hope would would uh, also argue that math syntax um, is important and 
What we've been exploring with this project, I Heart LA, is how can we actually make it easy to communicate math and to communicate math in a way where it's also executable. So our inspiration really was uh, whiteboard math. And we tried to create a language that looks as close as possible to whiteboard math so that a person looking at um, you know, a piece of code in iHeart LA will see something that looks like math they're used to seeing written on whiteboards, written in papers. And then we can compile that down to uh, LaTeX code. We can also compile that um, into executable Python um, using uh, NumPy and SciPy uh, libraries. We can also compile that um, down to C++ with Eigen. So, uh, and I, I should also say that uh, one of my collaborators would be uh, very disappointed, uh, Alec, uh, if, if I didn't also mention that we have MATLAB output uh, for this piece of code uh, for iHeart LA. Um, so that was in SIGGRAPH Asia uh, in 2021. I really encourage you to take a look and kick the tires. Uh, we have a, a demo page online that lets you uh, try to write some code and see what the output looks like. And lastly, I want to give a uh, encouragement to take a look at a paper later on in HPG on Thursday. Um, Andrew will be um, presenting this a paper on better fixed point filtering with averaging trees, which al also throws compute at um, you know figuring out what the the best average averaging trees are for various algorithms um it uh i think is a really cool piece of work um with uh really interesting um results that uh everybody will enjoy i want to of course thank the huge amount of collaborators on these projects um in particular a lot of the uh halide stuff that I presented in the beginning, really the credit goes to uh, Jonathan Reagan Kelly and Andrew Adams um, and the many developers that um, kind of got that compiler to the point where we could start building a whole bunch of research projects on top of it. And of course, all of the interns and students who do most of the work uh, and uh, uh, you know are, are really the hardworking engines for all of research uh, that I'm sure we see in the entire conference. So now uh, I'm ready to uh, take some questions. Um, I will uh, leave some time for that. And thank you for having me once again. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question, Bart. Um, I, the question is is around. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, Tammy. Do you yeah, want to read the question? There was a, a little technical glitch. So no that's a lot for the for the presentation and this very inspiring talk, uh, Shoaib. And uh, we have a couple of questions. We have plenty of time for questions. So let's go one by one. Uh, the first one that was asked here is: Can Dexter also convert halide back to C plus plus and if so much did differ from the unoptimized version, I think this question was answered during, during your, your presentation. Yeah. Uh, the second one is, uh, do you envision something similar for more heter heterogeneous workloads like graphics where there are elements of fixed pipeline like rasterization, ray tracing, or GPU tensor cores? I think that's a great question. Um, so what I really envision here in my hope is that um, we can start by building the building blocks for the various pieces, um, you know, languages that allow us to build better rasterization, ray tracing, and so on, um, and and you know, to to find ways to actually um, 
integrate those sublanguages. Now, in the case where you have heterogeneous workloads where there is hardware that specifically supports those operations, I think in that case, what we really are trying to do is to support those pieces of hardware through various domain-specific languages. Um, in particular, you know, I think it is a goal for uh, researchers working on Halide to support the tensor cores uh, out of Halide. Um, it is not easy because um, I'm sure, as you're aware, the data has to be in particular uh, layouts in order to use um, that hardware. But yeah, I mean, I think that the heterogeneous problem is 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 makes things quite difficult because it's really hard to cross language boundaries. Um, my hope, though, is that we can start by building building blocks that do a good job on the various pieces. And then we can start thinking about how do those get integrated with one another or whether they even need to get integrated with one another. Um, it may be the case that um, uh, you, know, you just leave outputs in your uh, GPU register file and then the code generated by the next part of the pipeline can just take those. Thanks, thanks. Um, guys, don't hesitate to ask more questions. Uh, I see another one. Um, in the case of the paper, I love linear algebra. Is it easy to accommodate newer grammars or representation lexicons, symbols, as many people have different ways of writing the same set of equations? That's... Oh, that's a very good question. So, um, I think at the moment, we've really been concentrating on uh, convention and having an opinionated convention. Um, and what that really means is that right now, there is a single grammar that does allow people to express things in a few different ways. But for the most part, we've kind of settled on like, this is the way to you know write multiplication. This is the way to do, um, uh, you know, write sine and cosine, for example. Um, what you're pointing at is a really interesting area, I think, of future research, which is kind of a um, how can we have more of a plug-in syntax in the front end for iHeartLA. Um, there is precedent for things like that. Um, there are programming languages like Racket that essentially allow you to completely change the syntax. The default syntax in Racket is something that looks like scheme or, or Lisp, you know, lots of parentheses, but there are also plugin syntaxes that look more like Python, um, others that look like documentation markup. So right now I would say for iHeartLA, we, we have not yet thought about the problem of changing front end syntax easily but I think that's an interesting future area that we should think about um, because I think, you know, if there's one thing that's as contentious as, as uh, you know, Vim or Emacs <laughs> editor wars, it is uh, math syntax wars. Thanks. Uh, the next question in line is, did the translation of unoptimized code to Halide bring up bugs that hadn't been discovered before? That's a great question. Um, in the process of um, building Dexter and doing the automatic translation, as far as I remember, I don't think we we found um, any true bugs. We had some things that were, um, I would call implicit semantics. So these were things where, for example, the input and output have to be the same array. Um, but that wasn't expressed in the original code. In our hand optimization, in our hand porting that we've done outside of um, applying Dexter, uh, absolutely. There have been cases where uh, we discover bugs that um, you know have to do with uh, corner cases where like you know if, if you have the extrema value, um, you won't get the answer you expected. Um, in C++. And as you can imagine, this is a uh, difficult thing to try to figure out because if the bug has existed for so long, is it a bug or is it a feature? 
at that point. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, while maybe some other people may ask questions, we, we do have time. I, I do have a few ones. Uh, the, the first one for me is uh, coming back on one of your statements that uh, graphics problems uh, are often amenable to uh, approximation. That is absolutely true. And the thing is, when we write a graphics algorithm, very often the end algorithm is itself an approximation of the original intent. And so I was wondering whether like, there was a possibility to provide suggestions of optimization while writing the algorithm. Because you know, like two different algorithms might lead to very different set of samples, for instance, on subdomain. But those two set of samples might be equally good at integrating a given function on this domain. So, uh, while designing the algorithm, having optimization cues uh, s sounds intriguing. And I was wondering if you explored this direction in the past. Yeah, so I think some work related to things that, that uh, we have been working on uh, really are applicable in this direction. Um, so one area that um, one of uh, our former interns at Adobe, uh, Pavel Pencheka, um, who's at the University of Utah, has been exploring is how to actually suggest to programmers more accurate ways of expressing a computation. So, you know, floating point itself to, is an approximation in a lot of ways, right? So what his work really is, is if you have floating point expressions that you're writing during your code, how can you actually rewrite those expressions so that they have less error? Um, so that's one area where, you know, throwing a lot of compute at something is one way to do that. And the the, the um, underlying algorithm that they're using there, you know, considers all possible rewrites. In terms of the optimization opportunities, uh, you know, I believe some of the auto scheduling work that we've been looking at also is in that vein where it's a starting point for, for doing optimization. Um, it does not at this point really take into uh, account approximation. So I think approximation there is an open area that none of the stuff that we've looked at really has considered heavily. Thanks. Uh, we have a question on the board by, by Nathan, actually. Uh, hi, Nathan. Uh, for future languages, how important will it be to add constructs to more deeply communicate it with the compiler in a two-way dialogue? Uh, that's a great question, Nathan. Um, I think that it is going to become uh, more and more important to do that for programs in which performance, absolute performance, is uh, the end goal. So basically, you know, for many programs, like good enough performance is fine. But when you really, really care about that speed, I think that it does really require um, conveying rich semantic information to the compiler. In order to um, in order to give the compiler enough information to apply particular optimizations or to prove that optimizations the programmer is asking for are valid, um, and so in that sense, yes, I do think it's going to become more and more important. You know, as code gets more complex, as code really starts dealing with multiple data structures. Um, with various different options in how that data structure can look like, um, deeply conveying the semantics to the compiler um, in order to take advantage of more complex hardware as well is, is going to be uh, more and more necessary. Uh, the nice thing is that you know, for libraries, uh, a lot of times you have, um, you have vendors or other library writers who are able to give you good enough performance in most cases. Um, but for the real uh, high performance uh, algorithms that um, you know a lot of us really care about, this is going to be really important. Thanks. We still have time for one extra question. I think one or two, if needed. Uh, I do have another question, which is uh, uh, might sound a little bit exotic, but uh, I will ask it still. Um, so over the last 10 years, we saw more and more 3D assets coming as parametric objects instead of uh, static data. And so when you look at those objects, materials, shapes, even lighting environments, they actually come in the form of a graph. 
which in itself is a program that is run by some execution engine that produce you know, some low-level code that some rendering engine can actually interpret. And so assets become logic, assets become program in this, uh, in this scheme. And I was wondering if you looked into asset optimization, that kind of asset optimization, through methods such as the ones that you have been uh, showing today. That's a great question, Tammy. This is uh, an area that I'm very interested in. And you know, some of our explorations there are, I would say, nascent. Um, but the, the key idea is exactly how you're describing it. Basically, right now, the way these things are kind of created is that you have this graph that's interpreted. And one thing that we've been really trying to explore is, can we actually consider the thing that generates code for that particular graph um, as a compiler? So instead of doing just local stringing together local operations, which is mostly what today's um, engines do, can we actually try to treat it as a compiler um, and do a global optimization or do an optimization that's guided by programmers? Um, I think that's not, not as exotic as you think. It's something that we really would like to do, but I think it's very early in those explorations. Um, and you know, in general, I think there's a lot of areas where we have things that are currently run through what I would call interpreters today, um, which really just deal with like one node of a graph at a time um, that we would like to turn into compilers where now we can try to consider the entire node graph as a program and we can do things um, like eliminate redundant computations and do optimizations across the entire graph. You see a lot of this work in the uh, machine learning world already. Uh, I think a lot of the um, recent performance improvements we're getting is just due to things like uh, collapsing together some of those memory bandwidth bound nodes so that you don't read and write from memory back and forth. You just do the computation in memory, for example. Um, and so applying that to those th those kinds of um, asset graphs is, is going to be a, a really interesting area of research. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Trey. The uh, well, the time is almost off. Thanks for all your all the answers and the talk and the keynote that was really inspiring. Uh, this will conclude the keynote for today. Uh, everyone, we can we can probably thank Shoaib again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I hope you will all enjoy the, the social rooms that you can join during the break. We are having a short break now. And uh, we reconvene in 15 minutes for the diversity and inclusion keynote. Thanks, everyone. See you.
Hello. Um, next, we will um, present, uh, Apollo will present his talk on diversity in art uh, time or rendering perspective. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, so um, the talk is pre recorded. Um, Apollo is a long standing, uh, long time HPG attendee and previous winner of an HPG Best Paper Award runner up. And uh, he graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, where he attended, where he uh, got his bachelor's and then his master's from uh, UT Austin and then later his PhD from UIUC. And he helped found and direct the HPG Diversity Scholarship Program and served on the HPG committee for the last four years. And he's currently working at NVIDIA on the openly worse rendering team as a senior ray tracing engineer. Also, um, if you uh, are interested in his book and his story, um, feel free to um, purchase his book, Through the Valley. I can, I can recommend it, it's very interesting. And without further ado, let's start with the video, with the presentation. Welcome to my talk, Diversity in Our Time, A Rendering Perspective. My name is Apollo Ellis. I am a doctor of computer science uh, with emphasis in computer graphics and rendering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I have a master's from the University of Texas, Austin, and a bachelor's in computer science from the University of California at Berkeley. This is not an NVIDIA talk. This content relates in no way to my employer NVIDIA or any of its affiliates or standpoints on any topics whatsoever. This is my story and purely so. So diversity is something I've thought about for many years. And I think I've always had trouble kind of convincing myself and framing it to myself in the context of something like HPG. Um, and that's because I really don't know how to relate the experiences that I've had in life with the experiences that other people have had in life and then somehow tie those into what we do for a living and who we are and what our contributions are going to be at the same time. And I do think those things are somewhat related. But moreover, I think that it's important for us to just be aware that the probability with which a given contribution in this, in this community contributes to the final render, so to say, uh, those probabilities are, are vastly different. And if we're going to get a better, you know, more efficient renderer at the end of the day, theoretically, by using something like important sampling, and yes, I'm still talking about diversity, by the way. If we're going to efficiently kind of solve this problem, and our problem in this community is graphics, if we're going to get the best ideas and the best contributions, we need to kind of watch out for biasing our results by simply picking the, you know, the people and the uh, contributions that seem to be the brightest, right? Because when you have other probabilities for these other samples and these other ideas and other contributions which could be out there in the community and you don't properly weigh them when they come in what you do is you kind of lose your you lose your unbiasedness first of all but also i feel like you get the wrong image and so that's a convoluted way to say that as a community as hpg we do want to encourage people who who don't necessarily usually contribute to contribute and i think this applies to all kind of other walks of our field so in, whether you're in business and a team or you're in school uh in industry whatever it is i think that um not discounting the the not not discounting the difficulty and low probability of some contributions versus those of others is going to shoot us in the foot at some point. So, um, yeah. So yeah, my theory is that DNI brings us closer to ground truth and faster. It's a more efficient renderer, so to say. And, um, I think that we're solving such a hard problem here as computer graphic scientists that, we really are going to need a lot of different ideas and perspectives. So to that note, um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am uh, today. Okay, so first off, um, at about 12 years old, when most of you were probably either studying algebra or pre-algebra in junior high, I was jumped into a street gang, um, which was known to be very, very violent, both towards other street gangs and towards its own members. So I was uh, a victim of lots of violence from within my gang and also lots of violence between my gang and the other rival gangs. And uh, so going to school, for example, sometimes in the morning, I'd get out of the car and I'd notice that there was 20 to 30 rival gangsters waiting for me outside of the school. And I had to kind of somehow figure out a way to get to class without getting killed. So this was uh, a part of my life. And it wasn't something that I knew how to deal with as a 12 year old or that I was particularly adept at. But this is what I was dealt. So this is actually an image of me um, taken a few years later after uh, the initial gang violence had kind of died down, but I had sort of decided that I was a thug and that this is the life that I was destined to lead. And uh, as you can see, smoking away and being very uh, daunting in my look was something that I felt was important. Again, at this point, most of you were probably in pre-calculus. So yes, while most people who had a future in the community like HPG were learning about things like this and learning to solve problems like these, I was more or less trying to learn how to solve problems like these, which were in my face all the time. And as you notice, they look somewhat similar to how I did in the picture. So I was lost in this entire world of the, the ghetto and of crime and of violence and of kind of this warfare stuff. And uh, I was very lucky to even make it out alive um, by many standards. What I thought was important at that point was somehow making money and um, having power. And at 15, I don't think you should necessarily be concerned with such things. But if you are, it's very tempting for younger people, I think, especially in the places where I'm from, to think that the easiest way to do that is through some illegal or streetwise manner. And obviously that's not a good idea. And this is how I got to learn that lesson. So again, um, while people who are going to get to where I'm at now typically would be in an AP English class or AP Spanish class or AP math class or AP uh, programming class in preparation for college. Uh, I was preparing to do exactly the opposite and go absolutely nowhere uh, with my life. So in my opinion, and from the people that I've talked to who grew up where I grew up and who went through the kind of things that I went through, the choices that I wouldn't actually even call them choices, but the, the routes that we took uh, tend to not end well on average. And I'm not saying that everyone who gets jumped into a gang dies, but everyone has some kind of horror story from these kind of uh, walks of life. So for mine, I was, with a bunch of people partying up all night, many, many days, um, very tired, very just, just overdone it for, for quite a while. And someone I knew who I looked up to, who was like a hero to me in this kind of 
street game and drug game and all this stuff uh, turned out that turned out to also turned out to be a psycho and decided that he was going to try to kill me and so and so he decided that um, one night while I had been passed out from partying that he would take me in his car and unfasten uh, my seatbelt and proceed to drive off of a freeway so apparently he was also somewhat suicidal um, drive off of a freeway at full speed um, in the middle of the night so once that happened um, I think I had PTSD diagnosed shortly after and as you can imagine um, self-esteem dropped and there were a lot of other repercussions but most importantly my mental health began to fade fairly quickly so while many of you at this age were probably doing something like this graduating from high school i was more like here and luckily so because i very well could have been dead from all the things that i had been going through and doing in my life after some time uh, i recovered from my kind of high school experiences well recovered quote unquote I spent a lot more time alone and I stopped hanging out with the people that I used to hang out with. Now, something new or a new demon, I like to say, set in and uh, made its way into my life. And as I mentioned before, my mental health, which had been seriously shattered by some, some experiences from my childhood uh, began to deteriorate into something much more serious in terms of a mental health condition so it turned out that all this stuff that I thought was important in my life turned out to just be turned out to just be this as an adult things that I would look back on and cringe or fear and could never really escape um, and began to kind of govern my experience in the world. So, yeah, so it turned out that I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and uh, that was actually right after I decided to return to school. So this was somewhat bad because I had kind of decided to turn my life around and then this hit and um, I don't think I or my family or really anyone I knew was anyone in my in my circle was prepared to deal with something like this. And actually here to turn things around a bit and to credit the incredible scientific breakthroughs in the work that we've had in our culture and uh, in the world, there was a solution for this. There was something out there that did work. Um, now there's side effects and you will be taking this for your whole life but if you do uh, it's possible to recover absolutely and so meanwhile I finally got to do some some solid studying and do some math and start to think differently about the world um, than I did as a youngster and I think that was uh, yeah, this was probably one of the most beautiful times in my life because I started to kind of leave behind all this hell that had erupted into my life at a very young age. And I started to think, you know, like a programmer, right? I started to be more logical and take classes in C++ and think about things like the future and think about things like how to make the most money and what kind of degrees do I need and what do I want to do? And believe it or not, I actually knew I wanted to do computer graphics from about the second year as a programmer. I wanted to, as many uh, people do, go into uh, game development. And so I started learning about uh, 3D art and also about how to program with that. Uh, eventually I even made my way here. So this is uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I buckled down, studied hard, and I got in as a transfer student uh, this is a shot of uh, the tower and obviously 
and uh, of the Math Hall and Corey Hall, which is actually where EE and CS are at Berkeley. And uh, I guess the best thing of all back then was that the past stopped looking like this. It wasn't this demonic, freaky thing that I thought was going to come back and get me. It just started to look like there was a future. Um, I started to look down the road and I kind of did feel like, you know, a cowboy uh, on his horse riding off into the sunset uh, after a while and things just began to uh, turn around. So I finally, I finally got myself some of these, uh, got some tassels and uh, some more tassels. Uh, so this is a uh, graduation from the masters. And then, you know, I started to notice that my heroes had changed uh, in particular. So this is supposed to be a kind of a businessman, Superman hero guy who uh, you might not consider a superhero um, naively, but arguably just like, you know, my life was turned around by the feats of science. And, um, you know, I think that as an industry, we, we do do some, some really incredible things. Uh, I began to attract towards things like, you know, legendary programmers. Uh, one of my first heroes um, was John Carmack. And I thought that he was the coolest thing since sliced bread. And if you had rewinded my life 10 years ago, I would think, well, he's just a nerdy white guy. Why would I care about that? So things had come had become completely different for me, and this 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 continued. Even me, I started to feel like I was good at this stuff, and maybe I was maybe I was a superhero of some sort. And yeah, I actually published some of these. So. My first year in grad school at UIUC, we submitted a paper, it got rejected, and I came to give the talk anyways as part of some extended poster session. The next year, the paper was accepted. The next year, I had a cool ray binning paper or ray binning poster that I submitted to HPG and got to come present. Uh, took a year off to actually graduate and then came back in 2019. And that was actually the first year that we started the diversity program. And I was lucky enough to, or, um, well, I was blessed enough to uh, win a Best Paper Award that year. And so here's a picture of that uh, with my co-authors, Warren Hunt and John Hart. Uh, definitely two of those superheroes that we saw in the earlier slides, at least to me. Okay, so what did we do together here? We looked at some facets of life that absolutely make no sense with respect to them producing um, contributions to HPG, <laughs> right? But they did. And so I think if we're smart, we'll use that as feedback into our, you know, our, our important sampling mechanism to remember that some of those paths that go off uh, in some crazy direction in our scene some of those paths actually do return a contribution and therefore we should weight them appropriately and um, especially for the future of our conference we should uh, we should be aware and we should focus at least some amount of resource towards um, helping people from paths that don't make sense make it to the conference, make it to the field, make it into STEM, and make it into a position in life where they can contribute something meaningful. In a lot of ways, this may just seem like some juxtaposed talk in the middle of a conference where it has no place. And that's all right, because sometimes you do start with a noisy image while you're trying to, while you're trying to converge on the right thing. And effectively, you can consider this a firefly. Every path tracing enthusiast's best friend.
And so as much as I'd like to consider myself some rising phoenix, I'm actually more or less just a part of this process, just a part of, of a Monte Carlo integration over, uh, over the future of the world. So yeah, diversity takes time. Um, so does path tracing, but we'll definitely get there. We're going to need all the samples that we can get. And, uh, we're going to need to try to stay unbiased as much as possible. This is my favorite slide from the entire slideshow, mainly because this is my favorite thing to say to myself when I think about how massively different uh, people and teams and things get together and create incredible um, products. And I will say that um, where I've ended up and on my team, um, we are very different and, and together we're a strong team. And I will say that as a community in HPG and as rendering and graphics people, um, we're all kind of superheroes and we all do incredible things together. And we're, we are, believe it or not, still very different and uh and i think that makes us strong so we'll get there um in a few seconds <laughs> to the end of the talk and uh i just want to thank you guys for coming and i'll see you in the metaverse fully unironic A very inspiring talk by Apollo. Um, he said that he can be online uh, and only today, so we might find him in the social room for discussion later today. So if you're interested in talking to him, and uh, without further ado, oh, um, Apollo says he's here. Yeah. So if you're interested in talking to him, I guess we can uh, we can find him in the social room just because. Uh, now we need to start the paper sessions as we're already over over time right now. Okay, good morning or evening and welcome to the Graphic Systems Technical Paper Session. I'm Simon Fenney, Research Fellow at Imagination Technologies. My apologies to those who are expecting Matt Farr. Uh, we've got three great papers for you in this session. Um, the first paper is entitled Software, Raster Raster <coughs> Software Rasterization of 2 Billion Points in Real Time. And it's by Marcus Schutz, Bernard Kebel and Michael Wimmer. Um, they're all from the Technische University in Vienna. Uh, the paper will be presented by Marcus Schutz. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, hey everyone. Thanks for joining the session today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about software authorization of point clouds and how we can be faster than the hardware pipeline using it. So the problem that we're trying to tackle here is that um, when you're uh, doing some laser scanning or um, area lighter scanning, you end up with point clouds with a lot of points, so millions to billions of points. And here, for example, we have data sets with 4 million points, 500 million points, a billion points, and 640 billion points. And um, we'd like would not like to be able to render these kinds of points in real time without pre-processing. And at least for um, anything that uh, fits on the GPU, uh, we can make this work with software authorization. For anything larger than that, we will still need some kind of level of detail structures. 
So uh, let's take a look at the related work here. Um, first of all, if you're trying to do fast uh, resolution of points, uh, you um, might want to take a look at uh, native point primitives like chill points, point list, and so on in OpenGL, DirectX, and Vulkan. Uh, in DirectX, it will produce uh, pixel-sized points, and in OpenGL and Vulkan, you can even create uh, sized quads here. Um, the problem with those is that um, they are largely built on top of the triangle-oriented hardware and rendering pipeline. And um, Günther et al., they found out that using software authorization, you can actually beat GL points by uh, an order of magnitude. And the approach they were using is to use spin lock to, automatic, uh, to atomically update uh, pixels color and adapt buffer. And uh, once a thread um, updated adapt and color buffer, it then unlocks the pixel again for another thread or another point. Um, Mars et al., they used uh, atomic min-max operations to uh, um, reproject that buffers to multiple views, and um, they were using 32-bit atomic uh, min or max operations. And with 32-bit, uh, this was enough for um, depth values, but it wasn't enough to atomically update a depth and a color buffer. Um, in our previous work about rendering point clouds with compute shaders and vertex order optimization, uh, we then used 64-bit atomics to simultaneously update an interleaf depth on the color buffer. So we just encode both the depth and the color value into a single 64-bit integer, and then use, use atomic min to find the point of the smallest depth value. And of course, there's also nanites-related work. Um, uh, nanite, they found out that uh, for very small triangles, it's actually faster to use software restoration using 64-bit atomic min-max operations to um, find the triangle with the smallest depth. And what they do is they encode the depth and the triangle ID into a 64-bit integer, and then the 64-bit atomics to find uh, um, the closest fragment. So um, the contributions of this paper, so our paper uh, directly builds on uh, the previous paper about rendering point class with compute shaders. And previously, uh, what we've done is we rasterized points with the 64-bit atomic min operations. And um, we also did some improvements like um, avoiding contentions with subgroups. So if we have 10,000 GPU threads that try to simultaneously update one single pixel, that leads to some contention that uh, seriously hurts performance. And with subgroups, you could merge multiple points in a warp into one single atomic update. Um, and we were also checking some various different vertex orders and found that, uh, unsurprisingly, Morton order performs very well, at least for compute shaders uh, or software resourcation, but it worked terrible for chill points. So what you could do, for example, is uh, to do, uh, sort by Morton order and then do some kind of shuffling so that you have um, good locality from Morton order, but not too much locality that would hurt performance of chill points. The problem is that with that is that we still have bottlenecks uh, in the scheduling of the threads and especially with the bandwidth usage. So the new contributions of this paper here is that we are now using a batched approach. So we group multiple points to a batch. And this allows us to, do, uh, to efficiently do things like frustum culling, LOD rendering, and uh, also importantly, adaptive coordinate precision, which uh, significantly reduces the bandwidth that we need. So um, the generation of the batches is actually pretty stupid. Uh, we simply group 10,000 consecutive points in memory into a batch and compute a bounding box of that. And this works uh, fine in most cases so for many data sets that you find in practice. And if it doesn't work, you can simply sort by Morton order and it will work fine. So to the right here, you can see a, a small point cut with a million points. And at the bottom here, um, what this looks like if you call it as individual batches here. So um, in previous work, we were spawning one thread for each point, and um, this isn't very efficient scaling-wise. So what we're doing now is we spawn one workgroup for one batch. So one workgroup has 128 threads, one batch about 10,000 points. And the first thing a workgroup does is it does frost and calling for this batch that it processes. And um, yeah, if the batch is not visible, it aborts right away. Um, this approach is now also uh, nicely compatible with LOD rendering, and the workgroup can also check if this uh, level of detail node should be called. And then the workgroup um, computes a required coordinate precision for this batch, and then uh, each thread of this workgroup 
proceeds to render about 80 points. So it loops through 80 points instead of rendering one single point per thread. So the depth of quadrant precision, um, this is uh, one thing that significantly improves the performance here because the previous work was limited by memory bandwidth usage. So we were able to render up to 50 billion points per second, but with 16 bytes per point, that was a memory bandwidth usage of 800 gigabytes per second. And uh, this already hits um, almost limits of um, the highest end graphics cards. So what we're proposing to do instead is to do some kind of adaptive precision, where instead of storing the points as floating point coordinates that need 32 bit per axis, uh, instead we store a point in fixed precision coordinates and use 10 bits per axis. So uh, we need about a third of the memory bandwidth now for the coordinates and 10 bits that is sufficient to uh, encode about 1,000 different coordinate values. So assuming that a batch is smaller than 500 pixels, 1,000 different values per axis is more than enough to uh, represent this um, with high fidelity. Um, if a batch is much larger than that, uh, or larger than 500 pixels, we can simply on demand load additional bits. So uh, uh, by default, we load these 10 bits here from this low precision buffer. And uh, if we need 20 bits, we still load these 10 bits from this low precision buffer, but we also uh, load another 10 bits from this medium precision buffer. And by uh, putting them together, we get a 20 bit coordinate. Um, in any case, if you look at this image to the right here, uh, you can see all these individual batches color differently. And uh, you'll find that um, any of these batches, all of these batches here are smaller than 500 pixels. So only when you zoom in very closely to something, you will end up with some batches that actually need 20 bits and most batches in the scene will always need 10 bits, even in close up views. Um, and if you look at the bottom right here at this uh, individual batch here, um, you can see uh, that the uh, batch is not optimally compact because we're simply uh, grouping 10,000 consecutive points in memory into a batch. Uh, and you get some jumps from the Morton code order here. But that is usually perfectly fine. So you have some uh, batches with small jumps and um, there are very, very few batches with large jumps. And if you have a couple of batches with large jumps, you simply render them with 10 bits precision. So another thing that's now possible efficiently is level of detail rendering um, together with the layered point cloud structure. So the layered point cloud uh, is a spatial hierarchical structure uh, that originally uses binary tree. Uh, we are using an octree here. And each node of this um, hierarchical structure has a subsample of the full point cloud. So when we're looking at this root node here, we get a very core subsample of the whole point cloud. And um, this, since it's an octree, we have up to eight children here. And each of these children, they have some additional points uh, that we can render to improve the detail. And in order to um, make this level of detail structure work with our software riser, we just need to do two changes to the pipeline. So first of all, uh, we simply treat each level of detail node here as a batch and uh, a batch with a variable amount of points. So previously um, I said that each batch has about 10,000 points. Uh, now it's closer to about 1,000 to 50,000 points. Um, doesn't really matter. Um, and the other change that we do is we discard small nodes, so nodes that are smaller than about 100 pixels. Because these octree nodes, they um, contain more details than we really actually need. So we discard them to save some performance. Uh, in the paper, you will also find some further optimizations that you can look up, like for example, um, a visibility buffer. We use a visibility buffer now, where instead of rendering the colors, we uh, render the point indices and resolve the color afterwards. We also use some prefetching where um, uh, when each thread loops through all these points and instead of loading one point and then render it, loading another point and then render it, we load four points at once and then load, uh, render these four points and then we load another four points and then render these four points. And uh, this is a surprisingly big um, performance improvement of about 30%. Also, uh, if you're doing uh, virtual reality rendering, you can um, render the periphery in a, at a lower amount of detail because uh, geometric details in the periphery, they are not as uh, visible as in the center. So um, regarding the results, um, this method, the main intention here was to have a fast brute force rendering performance. 
And uh, we were able to render 1 billion points in about 6.4 milliseconds on an RTX 3090. And of those 1 billion points, um, about 910 million points were actually processed. Uh, 90 million were frostum called. So about 10% were frostum called in this viewpoint here. Uh, what this means is that um, 140 billion points per second were processed and rendered. And if you um, um, calculate this in, at a, uh, in terms of how many we can render in 60 frames per second, we end up with a value of about 2.3 billion points that we can render at 60, 60 frames per second. Um, we also had a high GPU utilization with that. Uh, so uh, this speed of light that you can um, uh, compute with the NVIDIA profiler, uh, for compute, it was about 79%, and for memory, 91% with the prefetch optimization. So if you don't do the prefetching, this memory utilization was much, much lower, and uh, also the performance accordingly lower. So we also tried uh, applying this to virtual reality rendering, and um, this data set here, it, it has about 528 million points. And for virtual reality, we used uh, level of detail rendering because we needed extra performance here. Um, with the level of detail structure, we ended up rendering two, uh, 21 million points here and still got a good uh, quality. And to also have some kind of super sampling, uh, anti-aliasing, we rendered into two frame buffers with 6.8 million pixels each. And all of that took about 8.3 milliseconds, so um, well below the amount of time that we need to render at 90 frames per second in virtual reality. So here's an uh, example of what this can look like. And uh, when rendered, and uh, here you can see what the individual chunks look like. So these are the chunks that you get by grouping 10,000 consecutive points in memory into one batch uh, when the point cloud is sorted by Morton order. So wherever there's a high density, you have smaller chunks, and where there's a low density of points, you have uh, larger chunks. Um, when you're using the level of detail structure, you end up with chunks like this here. Um, they are very regular because we're using an octree structure. And uh, the more detailed, the finer, the smaller chunks, they are now discarded at runtime because um, batches that are smaller than 100 pixels, they have detail that we don't uh, need anymore or that we don't need um, as much anymore. So, um, of course, there are also some limitations like um, the quality wise. Uh, we were aiming for rendering as many points uh, as fast as possible uh, to compete with the GL points performance and to make it about 10 to 100 times faster. But we don't compete with surface with blend rendering, which um, targets high quality rendering. However, you can still use some blending approaches where you um, blend together overlapping points. Um, so if you look at the left image here, this is what you get with the um, normal point restoration, just taking the closest point. This is also what you get when using chill points. And to the right here, this is what you get by blending overlapping points together. And it reduces the performance by a factor about three. But this is also used for virtual reality rendering because you need that extra quality. So high quality together with level of detail rendering, um, then you will still end up with enough um, uh, performance. So other limitations is, um, yeah, we are rendering pixel-sized points. Uh, in this future work, we'd like to take a look at splat rasterization, so softer rasterization of splats, and try to see if we can also make this faster than uh, current approaches that use either GL points or some um, oriented triangles or quads. Um, we are also using right now still 16 byte per point. Uh, so we'd like to take a look at comp compression algorithms that uh, can be decoded fast at runtime. And uh, we're hoping that maybe there's something that could compress points down to one byte or two bytes per point so that we could fit up to 10 billion points, per, uh, points on a GPU. Also, color filtering is quite expensive right now, but um, if you're using LOD structures, you could do color filtering in lower levels of detail. So there's also some optimizations that could be done here to make it faster and look nicer. So um, yeah, I'll skip this here and go uh, straight to the practical uses of our application. So our um, intention, uh, so our motivation for this thing was to uh, be able to look at large amount of LiDAR data sets as quickly as possible without having uh, to spend time to um, for pre-processing like uh, downsampling or generating LOT structures. So here 
we can simply take all of these LAS files, drag and drop them in here and look at them right away. So this is about 100 million points right now. We can also take the remaining LAS files here, uh, rendered in real time while it's still being loaded without generating any LOD structure. And we end up with 570 million points here, rendered in real time. And in this case with the um, uh, high quality splatting, so blending of overlapping points. Um, also, another use case that we didn't anticipate, but which was pretty nice to see, is um, this ADOP paper here, where they use um, uh, fast software resourcation of points as a component of a neural novel view synthesis pipeline. So um, they're first rasterizing these points quickly, and then they're using a neural renderer to improve the results and to reconstruct a proper image out of that. And um, yeah, this paper will be shown at SIGGRAPH 2022. So I'm looking forward to seeing that in, uh, in person as well. And yeah, thank you for attention. If you want to take a look at the code, uh, feel free to check out this GitHub repository. Thank you, Marcus, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we've got time for questions, if people want to uh, write them on the question board. Um, in the meantime, uh, since we haven't got any there, um, I was just wondering about the Morton order. It's I can see that it's a good one-size-fits-all approach, but I was just wondering if you, is is can you also produce some other orderings that would be sort of better for particular view directions? So making it narrow, I suppose, narrow in the direction you're viewing. Uh, yeah, uh, I think so, yes. Uh, maybe you could even generate um, batches with kind of the same data, but um, better for a specific viewpoint um, by having some duplicate data specific for a viewpoint. You could probably also generate uh, more compact um, batches by using some kind of binning approach instead of Morton order. And with the spinning approach, the difference is that you'd probably end up with batches with different sizes and not always 10,000 points, mm -hmm. which is fine because um, that's the same thing that we're already also doing with level of detail rendering. So as long as it's in the order of about 1,000 to 50,000 points, it's not a problem. And if it's larger than that, you could still uh, uh, process the batches to make them finer grained or split them uh, to avoid too many jumps, stuff like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, we have a question. Um, how would your approach scale to different primitives, such as line segments, and what would be the challenges in this space? Oh, that's a very good question. I actually want to try line segments uh, at some point as well. Um, I think it might have some, uh, or it might have uh, definitely potential for that, um, because I guess lines are also probably built on the triangle hardware resourcation pipeline. And uh, in many cases, uh, if you have a lot of lines, like there was a paper at Eurographics, this fiblet rendering, you have um, billions of lines, but uh, you only have uh, a couple of million of pixels. So most of these lines, they will be very small, maybe even pixel sized or uh, sub-pixel sized. And in this case, this point rendering might actually speed up the line rendering. Um, what could be difficult is if you have a uh, larger line. So not yet sure how to approach that, maybe even with an approach like Nanite, where larger lines still get passed to the hardware rendering pipeline, but smaller lines get uh, directly rasterized in software. OK. Uh, maybe we can just squeeze one more question. Uh, could the blending of different points be replaced by a stochastic approach? Yes. Um, so this ADOP paper, for example, they do already use a stochastic approach, not, not for blending, but for removing points to save some performance. But yeah, I don't, also don't see any reason why a stochastic approach wouldn't work. Um, yeah, but I can't uh, think of it right now uh, from the top of my head. Okay. Well, I think we're probably out of time for questions. I think we should just thank our speaker one more time. And uh, we should move on to the uh, the next paper. <laughs> okay, so the second.
paper uh, is supporting unified shader special specialization by co-opting C++ features by Kerry Seitz from the University of California, Davis, uh, Teresa Foley at NVIDIA, Serbon Porum Vescu and John Owens, both from the University of California, Davis. Thank you. And this will be presented by um, Kerry Seitz. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so the overarching motivation of this work is to think about the problem that we have in real-time graphics programming, where we have a really strict divide between host code and GPU code. And so in real-time rendering, we generally have some code written on GPU platforms or to run on GPU platforms and some highly parallel uh, rendering calculations generally written in a special purpose shading language like GLSL or HLSL. And then we also have some corresponding host code that sets up and invokes this rendering work, including choosing which bits of GPU code to, to invoke and passing parameters to the GPU and other kinds of communication and coordination between the host and the GPU code. And this is generally written in some general purpose systems language like C++. And in real time, in the real time graphics APIs, there's this really strict divide between these two portions of code, which results in a lot of pain points, like subtle bugs if these two halves of code are not kept in sync with each other, which is really a manual process that the programmers are responsible for. And so instead, what I think we really want is a unified programming model for real time graphics. And in these so called unified environments, host and GPU code can be in the same programming language, same file, and same lexical scope. And they come with some inherent benefits, such as being able to just share types and functions between host code and GPU code and certain compatibility guarantees as well. Um, we can communicate between them using proper variables. We don't have any of these magic number binding points. And we can also be guaranteed that type layouts are the same. But unfortunately, none of the real-time graphics APIs provide any kind of unified environment. Uh, but in the GPU compute space, unified systems are really the standard with things like CUDA and SICL. And so you may be wondering, can't real-time graphics just use CUDA and Sickle? Yes. Thank you for coming to my talk. You've been a really great audience. OK, well, not really. And there are multiple reasons why graphics just can't use any of these existing systems. And in this work, we focus on one in particular, which is the lack of adequate support for GPU shader code specialization. So what exactly is that? Uh, let's look at an example. So let's say that we have a scene with three different types of materials that need to use different pieces of code to calculate their final rendered color. And so we might have some standard material that we're going to use for most objects, but then we also have some special materials specifically for skin and cloth. And along with the material specific shader code, we also have just a bunch of other complex code that we need to run in the shader in order to calculate the pixel's color. And lots of hand waving about exactly what that is. Um, but basically, we need to be able to slot in the material specific code at the appropriate place in the shader. And uh, to get the per best performance, what shader programmers typically do is to express these specialization options as static compile time branches. And so these will be evaluated when we compile the shader, depending on which type of material we've defined during compilation. And um, so we can generate a specialized shader variant just for the standard material, which results in a compiled shader that just contains the standard material code and strips out the code for the other two. And we can do the same for the skin and the cloth material, resulting in three total compiled shader variants, each specialized for exactly one material. And so when we're rendering, a, rendering an object that uses the standard material, we don't pay any of the costs associated with these other materials, such as any sort of shared local memory usage or higher register pressures or any other uh, negative costs. Um, then when we're shading an object, we can we can choose the shader variant specific to the material of that object. And so now on the left is that corresponding host code, the CPU code, that chooses which variant to invoke based on the runtime information of the scene being rendered. And if we compare the host code to the GPU shader code from a few slides ago, notice that the code on in the GPU is using a compile time parameter to generate these different variants. Uh, but the host code really needs to use a runtime version of that same parameter, since we don't know what material types are used until we actually go to render the scene at runtime. And that's really a key challenge with supporting unified shader specialization. Specialization parameters are compile time parameters in GPU code, but they're runtime parameters in host code. And in a non-unified world, we can work around this, as shown in those previous uh, slides, but in a unified system where we want a singular definition of these parameters, that same parameter now needs to serve both a compile time and a runtime purpose. 
Uh, and some prior works have explored unified shader programming, including shader specialization. Uh, so for example, BraidGL utilizes a programming language feature called static staging to express shader code and specializations. Uh, and our prior work on Salos uses these key set of language features called staged metaprogramming uh, that are available in the Lua Terra language to enable unified shader systems, uh, including specialization. However, neither BraidGL nor Lua Terra are widely used languages in real-time graphics. And more importantly, these key language features that these prior works rely on are not available in the widely used languages. And so what we wanted to ask is, can we bring the benefits of unified programming to today's shader programming systems in the near term? Can we meet these existing systems where they are instead of relying on some features that they just don't have access to? Um, and so to that end, we have some goals and constraints that guided our efforts. Um, so of course, we want to use a language that's widely used in real-time graphics. But more than that, we want to allow programmers to write code that really looks and feels familiar in that language. And so we really did minimize any changes to that language as much as possible. Um, because we're doing render real-time graphics, performance is obviously uh, really important. And in contrast to many prior works, we want to make sure that our approach and implementation strategies are ones that modern applications could adopt in the near term. And finally, as mentioned earlier, I think these systems really need to have first class support for shader specialization and composition in order to handle these compile time versus runtime dichotomy of specialization. Which brings me to the key insight of our work, which is that we can create such a unified system in an existing widely used language by co-opting existing features of that language and implementing them with alternate semantics that are better suited to the domain of real-time graphics. And so by co-opting existing features, this allows us to repurpose language features that are maybe not suitable for GPU code and instead use those to express GPU and graphic specific semantics and optimizations. And also by reusing existing features, we don't have to add a bunch of new stuff to the language and then worry about how that new, those new features might interact with the rest of the language. And so to demonstrate this, we created a unified shader specialization, or sorry, a unified shader system integrated into an existing game engine, specifically Unreal Engine 4. So uh, UE4 is a really popular, widely used game engine. And in UE4, users can write GPU shader code in HLSL. And then for each HLSL entry point, users must also write a corresponding C++ host side class to manage the host side aspects of shader setup and invocation. So let's look at an example. Uh, on the left is some GPU shader code written in HLSL. And on the right, we have the corresponding host shader class written in C++. And uh, on all these code examples throughout the talk, I'm not going to talk about the code in detail, but I'll just highlight a few key points. So we can see that we have things called uniform parameters, which are declared in both the GPU code and the host code. And it's really up to the users uh, to keep these declarations in sync and make sure that any changes are applied to both parts of the code. I'll also briefly mention varying parameters. So in this compute shader case, only the GPU code needs to declare them. But for these other types of shaders, like vertex and pixel shaders, both host and GPU code need declarations for varying parameters. And looking at one specific uniform par parameter for a second, I want to point out that host and GPU code don't share any types. And so we've declared a struct in the host code that must then be redeclared in the GPU code. Uh, so going back to the shader, we have also these specialization parameters, but we only declare them in the host code. But then they're actually then used in the GPU code. And so I'm going to omit a discussion of how this all works in UE4. But the point I want to make is that this is really easy to mess up. Like if I have a typo in the GPU code that uses a specialization parameter, I'm not going to get any sort of warning or error. And similarly, if there's a typo in the string name on the host side, I'm, I'm also not going to get any, any sort of help, diagnostic help on that. Um, and also, just forgetting to declare a parameter in the host code doesn't doesn't generate any diagnostics either. And so future readers of the code might be wondering whether that was intentionally omitted or if maybe that was a bug and it's supposed to be there. And I actually found myself in that exact situation. Um, and then a very crucial but subtle point um, of these specialization parameters is that they must be compile time constant in GPU code, but then they're set by runtime values in host code. And so as mentioned before, this is OK in a system where the host and the GPU code are, are separate and separate languages and separate files, and the UE4 toolchain handles compilation and dispatch appropriately. But this becomes a real issue in unified systems that we have to figure out a way to deal with. And so by looking at this code, we've identified the required elements of the interface between host code and GPU code. We need to be able to express uniform, varying, and specialization parameters, as well as some sort of entry point function to kick off GPU execution. Um, and I'm also going to claim that it's useful to be able to denote which other functions are GPU compatible. And so this allows host-only functions to use host-only features and vice versa. 
Um, so now let's look at our unified shader design, both to see how we express these various elements uh, and to see some of the benefits that the unified system provides. So here's an example of a shader in our unified system. And note that the left and the right parts of the slide are now both part of the same C++ class, all contained within one file. So just like UE4, uh, shaders in our system are written as C++ classes. But in contrast, this class contains both host code and GPU code. Uh, and the various elements of the host GPU interface are expressed using C++ attributes, including the uniform and specialization parameters, as well as marking GPU compatible functions in the GPU code entry point. And because both host and GPU code are unified into the same C++ class, uh, the programmer only needs to declare parameters once rather than needing separate declarations for the host and GPU code. And related to this, specialization parameters are now explicitly declared not only for host code, but also for GPU code. And so this enables the compiler to provide extra validation, such as catching this typo here as a compile time error rather than it causing just a subtle bug if it were only implicitly declared. And also thanks to the unified design, uh, types are shared between host and GPU code. And so the GPU code uh, just uses that qu uh, quality enum, and it can reference all the enum types uh, directly as well. Um, and lastly, remember that special specialization parameters must be compile time constant in GPU code, but then must be set by runtime values in host code. And so we handle this difference by requiring that the specialization parameters uh, are declared uh, to include all of the possible options for those parameters as compile time constants. And then in the host code, the programmer is free to set those parameters using just regular old runtime values. And our, our system handles that difference. Um, now that we know what a shader looks like in this unified system, let's dive into some of the specific design decisions for a system. Uh, we've already covered some of them. So for starters, we use C++ as our programming language of choice. It is one of, if not the most widely used languages in uh, real-time graphics. And it's a natural choice for our case uh, because it's what UE4 uses. Similarly, uh, UE4 already expresses host shader code as C++ classes, and so we do the same as our system, uh, same in our system rather. However, unlike UE4, our unified shader classes contain both host code and GPU code. Uh, the last two design decisions uh, are, are very much related to this minimize changes to the language idea. And so the first one we've already seen, uh, we're going to co-opt C++ attributes to express elements of the host GPU interface. Um, and so this attribute syntax is standard in C++11, but C++ does not provide any kind of support for user-controlled attributes. And also, the C++ compiler is free to ignore attributes that, that it doesn't understand. And so attributes are really not meant to change the semantics of the program. But in our case, ignoring these attributes will just result in an incorrect program. And so we're very much violating what the standard C semantics of C++ attributes are, are supposed to do. And instead, we repurpose them uh, for the needs of graphics programming. Uh, but even though, uh, even more so than these attributes, where our design really departs from standard C++ is our use of inheritance and virtual functions to implement shader specialization and composition. And you might be wondering, you know, why do we need to co-opt anything for, for composition and specialization? Uh, well, C++ really doesn't have what we need for the, the specialization optimization. It kind of has two main ways to compose together different classes. And so we could use just the standard inheritance and virtual functions uh, functionality. Uh, but this leads to dynamic dispatch of function implementations through the virtual function table. In contrast, we could instead use C++ templates. Uh, all template parameters need to be specified at compile time. And so this leads to static dispatch of functions. And what I'll claim is that dynamic dispatch is better for host shader code, since we want to invoke this GPU rendering work based on runtime parameter values. But in GPU shader code, specialization is really important to achieve the best performance. And so we really want static dispatch of all functions on the GPU. But this leads to some problems for the host code. And so what we have is this problem where neither of these options are suitable for, for unified shader code because the host code and the GPU code have different requirements. And so I hope it's kind of clear why virtual functions aren't a good solution in, in this case. Um, but in case you don't believe me about templates, I've got some extra slides we can talk about. And so the solution that we came up with is to co-opt virtual functions in order to implement specialization. And so programmers author shader code using uh, inheritance of virtual functions like normally would. But then the system will cogen different GPU specializations based on the relevant subtypes. And so host code can then set parameters just as it normally would in C++. But under the hood, the system will invoke different specialized GPU code based on the runtime types. And so in effect, we get the best of both worlds, all while allowing programmers to express composition in a very C++ style. 
So to look at this visually, programmers write what looks similar to just regular virtual, virtual function calls. And then uh, the system will generate de-virtualized versions of these virtual functions for the GPU code. Um, and it will also generate specialized GPU shader variants for shaders that use these virtualized functions. And so these programmers, uh, this allows programmers to write regular looking C++ code for their shaders, but then that code gets transformed into an implementation that's better suited to GPU code, and our system handles dispatch appropriately under the hood. Um, just to briefly mention some of the implementation uh, information. So we use a source to source translator built on top of Clang, but in a way that doesn't require modifying the Clang code base, which helps to, to limit implementation effort and maintenance costs. Uh, the translator walks the Clang AST to retrieve relevant info from user written source code, and it, it uses that info to generate HLSL for GPU code, including multiple shaders to turn dynamic dispatch into, uh, sorry, in order to turn dynamic dispatch via virtual functions into static dispatch instead. And then for host code, it generates C++ and uses UE4's existing shader system under the hood. And so this really helps to facilitate ease of integration and adoption by making these unified shaders compatible with ex existing C++ code, sorry, with existing UE4 code. Um, and I also want to point out that we could add support for other shading languages and other engines by writing additional backends. Our current implementation is specific to UE4, but our overall designs and ideas are not. Uh, so to evaluate our system, we rewrote some of UE4 shaders to use the unified system, and we ran the infiltrator demo using both the original shaders and our unified shaders. And as shown, the performance of our unified shaders is similar to the original UE4 versions. We don't really see any differences in performance. Um, and in addition, we wanted to make sure that our abstractions don't lead to any excessive code bloat. And so uh, similarly, the lines of code counts are comparable as well. Uh, we do have some additional lines uh, in our versions. Some of that is due to stylistic differences. Some of it is due to some minor code duplication. And in the end, yes, some of uh, some of these additional lines are due to our abstractions. But we think that the trade-offs are, are worth it for having more robust uh, user-friendly code. Um, as for limitations, our current implementation only supports compute shaders. Um, these are an increasingly large portion of a modern game shader code, and they're sufficient to demonstrate the challenges uh, we wanted to show. Um, but we, uh, we nevertheless don't support the other shader types at the moment. And similarly, our translator only supports UE4's global shaders, which are shaders that don't need to interface with the mesh or material systems. And so to uh, wrap up, we added unified shader programming to C++ by co-opting its existing features and implementing them with alternate semantics. So we co-opt C++'s attributes to express elements of the host GPU interface, and we co-opt inheritance and virtual functions for shader specialization. And since we aren't adding new features to C++, we're just reusing existing ones, our system can maintain compatibility with future versions of C++. Our unified shaders achieve similar performance and code sizes compared to the original UE4 shaders. Um, so as future work, I think it'd be interesting to try to co-opt features of another language for graphics pro programming, such as maybe using Rust's generics. I think it'd be also interesting to explore what kind of optimizations we can perform by giving the compiler a, a unified view of the code and more information with which to optimize. And I think maybe we can make these optimizations even more powerful if we developed programming models beyond just this separate shader per render pass thing that we, we typically use now. Um, and to sort of expand on that a little bit, you know, maybe we could write rendering code as one big integrated unit and then let the compiler choose how to split that up into different shader kernels. Um, and so I think you know, there could be some benefit from doing compile time analysis to figure this out. Um, but then there's also some greater potential for incorporating runtime optimizations too, perhaps leveraging information in a render graph system. And I want to note that unified shader programming and specialization support is really a prerequisite for these future types of systems. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank the many people who helped us and gave us feedback on this work. And also thank you to Intel Corporation and NVIDIA Corporation for financial support. And thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, we've got some source code available uh, for our translator on GitHub, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we have time for questions. Uh, let's see if there's any in there at the moment. Yeah, I think I see one at the top of the oh, question yes, board. Um, good. So how does this system compare to other similar systems such as Slang or Circle C++ shaders? 
Yeah, so um, regarding slang, uh, one kind of point is that it's not really what I would consider a unified language, since it really only is for the GPU part of shader code. Um, and you know, maybe maybe they'll do something like that in the future. Um, but one critical design element of slang is its use of uh, you know the, the slang style generics and um, uh, I forgot the name of it, uh, but slang style generics and uh, interfaces, that's the word, um, which really that that type of generic and interfaces aren't available in something like C++. Uh, and so I think if we were trying to, to, to apply the lessons of slang to C++, we would kind of have this mismatch in available features that we couldn't just use, uh, translate those lessons directly. Um, regarding C++ uh, Circle uh, shaders, for those not familiar, um, Circle is a, a newer C++ compiler that adds a bunch of new features to, to C++, uh, including some really interesting metaprogramming features. And it also has support for turning C++ into, uh, I believe, GLSL, or maybe it's Spear V, uh, so to compile C++ to shaders. And I think that's a really important prerequisite, is being able to translate C++ into GPU-compatible code. Um, so they're, they're doing that, which is awesome. Um, but as far as the interface between host and GPUs, I think that their solution to that might involve a lot of these new fancy features that they're adding, which is departing a lot from standard C++. And so one of the, the contrasts of our goal is to say, how can we stick as close to regular old C++ as possible and just make minor changes um, instead of trying to add new stuff to, to Circle? And to be clear, I think Circle is really cool. I think we just kind of are coming at it from two different angles. OK. Um, well, I had a question. Well, actually, I mentioned this to a colleague uh, who works in one of the other, other groups. And he was curious of who do you feel is the main beneficiary of this? Would you, would is it someone who's working on the, sort of like the engine software and providing a tool, or the actual game developer, or, or perhaps a poor person debugging the driver? Um, definitely the, fir the first two, definitely. I haven't thought about the third one. Um, but yeah, certainly the people actually writing the engine are writing a lot of shaders and writing a lot of shader code. And so they might be the ones both providing these tools and providing and you know doing the implementation that I did, but for real in, in something like UE4 or Unity. Um, but then the other people in that uh, company working on that tools would also benefit by by being able to have more robust code and not have to spend as much time debugging or dealing with minor compatibility errors that should really just be caught at compile time. Uh, and then also users of the engine who are, are creating their own games and might want to create their own shaders or, or their own rendering algorithms and things um, would also benefit then from, again, this, this increase in robustness um, while still being able to get uh, equivalent performance. Um, debugging the driver is more interesting because I think that's sort of you've lowered, like um, at least with our implementation, by the time it gets to the driver, you've you've stripped out all of that stuff. You've compiled down to the graphics APIs. You've compiled down to you know HLSL or GLSL or Spear V, um, and so I'm not sure if it would help with that as much, mm -hmm. um, other than being able to eliminate those same compatibility challenges that you might have otherwise. So you can kind of eliminate a class of bugs to say it's not this problem because the system handles it for us. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, uh, actually, I've just got one minor question. You, you gave some statistics um, with yours in terms of performance, and one of them was very, very slightly, yours was slightly slower. Have you got any reasoning for that? Is there any specific feature that's missing? Um, no, I don't think so. I think this might just be minor variance when you run the same thing twice is kind of, I, I didn't see anything that was obviously different. The code, when we generate it, looks pretty similar. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a satisfying explanation for you other than perhaps minor uh, drift um, okay. when you just run the same thing multiple times. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so since we don't have any other questions, um, shall we thank our um, presenter again? Thank you. Okay, so our final paper in the session is a data-driven paradigm for pre-computed radiance transfer by Laurent Belcourt and Thomas Delio, uh, who are both at Unity. Uh, William Barbier, uh, who who did this work while at Ensemaga in Grenoble, and Cyril Soler from INRIA. Uh, the paper is presented by Laurent Belcourt. Thank you.
precomputation at runtime. In the middle exists precomputed radiant transfer, a baking technique that allows for dynamic illumination at runtime. Precomputed radiance transfer was pioneered by Sloan and colleagues, follows the following principle. In a baking stage, a transfer matrix is precomputed, usually one per vertex of the asset. At runtime, this matrix is used to convert the projection of incident illumination in a directional basis to coefficients representing the outgoing radiance in possibly the same directional basis. This efficiently solves dynamic global illumination on single assets, however, with a few caveats. First, its frequency content is bound by both the projection basis for the incident radiance, but also by the asset's tessellation. This can cause light leaking and interpolation artifacts. A second caveat is that this baking process requires a dedicated solution since the projection basis acts as an implicit light source that we have to account for, and this prevents to fully reuse existing baking solutions. With the rise of machine learning, it would be tempting to replace precomputed radiance transfer with neural networks, and in fact, some have looked at this idea of reproducing Precomputed radiance transfer architectures with neural networks, such as the work of Rainer et al. To build such a solution, one needs to have access to a certain specific database of indirect illumination for different light configurations. And we were surprised to see this idea of using neural networks go forward right away, given that we have access to this same specific database. Indeed, once you have access to this database, an intermediate step is possible. And this intermediate step leveraged the data available to neural networks. So we are going to look at this problem of dynamic global illumination, again, for key assets and low frequency appearance. But we are going to construct precomputed radiant transfer in a data-driven fashion. We are going to make the hypothesis that we are only interested in reconstructing light conditions observable at runtime and that our database reflects the space. We are going to showcase such approach in different light transport scenarios, such as light transport on surfaces, in volumes, or in air. To understand how we build our data-driven formalism, I am going to look at the case study of a particular scene and note that this will mostly be an intuitive explanation. If you're interested in the mathematical details, please refer to the paper. Okay, let's start by assuming that we have access to a database of renderings for direct illumination for this Viking room scene. And let's assume that our database is enough to permit us to reconstruct any light configuration we are looking for. That is, for a given light configuration, we can evaluate its associated direct illumination as a weighted sum of the database elements. Here, the direct illumination X is reconstructed as a weighted sum of the database list elements with coefficient CK. Uh, since light transport is linear, if we have the dual database consisting of renderings of indirect illumination, we can reconstruct the indirect illumination associated with the given light condition by doing a weighted sum of the indirect illumination database, but with the same coefficients we used for direct illumination. In other words, if we know how to project the light configuration into the direct illumination database, we can evaluate its indirect illumination. And while this is theoretically sound, there is a catch, or at least two. First, we don't have access to the database of indirect illumination at runtime. And this would weigh too much memory and requires too many texture fetches to be viable. Second, we don't know how to evaluate the weight coefficient for a given 
direct illumination configuration. So from this, we show how to build a simple model for data-driven pre-computed radiance transfer. And we do so by building a meshless reconstruction basis to access the indirect elimination database, and we provide an efficient measurement of the coefficient through a sparse evaluation of direct elimination and also using a transfer matrix. It is not possible to store and use the full database of global elimination at runtime. However, we found that for the different test scenes we used, the effective dimensionality of each dataset was quite low. In this plot, you can see the error when reconstructing the complete database with an increasing number of its eigenvectors. For most of the scenes we used, 9 to 10 eigenvectors are sufficient to capture most of the energy. That means we can well approximate indirect illumination using only a handful of basis elements. Those are easily extracted using singular value decomposition. One last step is that we cannot store rendering using a fixed viewpoint for our database. While it is possible to store radiance information at the vertices of a mesh, much like PRT does, we found it better to use texture ma mapping. This even permits to reuse already available baking solution, such as light map bakers. We end up building our database with many light maps that are later decomposed in a tail basis using the SVD. To compact storage, we choose to share the basis for all the color channels and to pack them into RGBA texture. It follows at reconstructing the indirect illumination with 16 bases, we requires four textures at runtime. Okay, now that we have a way to build and access a database of indirect illumination, we need to do the same for the direct illumination. Instead of projecting the incident lighting into a basis, we choose to measure direct illumination at a sparse set of location on the assex or on its convex O. For that, we use a small default shading pass on a fixed G buffer with pre-computed position and normals. This position are evenly distributed using sample illumination, and you can see them on the screen. This permits to build a database of direct illumination measures and evaluate it during runtime. However, we are still left with the task of computing the coefficient for a given vector x with respect to the database. But we won't need an explicit way of computing them. We show in the paper that we only need a transfer matrix for that. Why so? Because the database produces a mapping between the direct illumination and the indirect illumination. It does so by storing for each random light configuration both a direct and an indirect vector. Indeed, we, measure, we use the measurement points to evaluate a vector of direct lighting. And the decomposition of the associated light map of the indirect illumination in the basis produces a vector of coefficient, here u0, to reconstruct the indirect illumination. So we indeed have a mapping between the vector of direct illumination x0 and the coefficients of indirect illumination u0. And when we build the database, we accumulate pairs of vectors. And this results in two matrices. First, x that describes the direct lighting and u that describes indirect lighting. For both matrix, we can extract a transfer function that maps direct illumination to indirect illumination. In our case, we choose to use least square regression to build a transfer matrix M that converts any direct illumination vector into coefficient of indirect illumination. Implicitly, M encodes the projection that gives the coefficient to decompose direct illumination in the database. Okay, now we need to put everything together for our runtime algorithm. 
Given a light configuration, we rasterize and shade direct elimination on our asset. Then, we load the small g-buffer of measurement points and perform a deferred shading pass on it. It outputs a vector of the elimination, x. We multiply this vector by the precomputed matrix, transfer matrix M, using a compute shader. This provides a vector of coefficient that we multiply by the basis stored in the textures. This gives us the indirect elimination in UV space. We do the last step in a fragment shader or in the deferred pass, and this avoids to compute texels that are not visible by the camera. And that's it. We have our indirect elimination on our asset that we accumulate with the direct elimination to get our final result. A nice property of our method is that it is very simple to extend for animation. Actually, in some cases, this is as simple as building a dataset with random poses, as you can see here, where we got direct illumination on the left and the indirect illumination on the right for different light configuration and animation poses. We experimented that we could share most runtime elements, such as building a single matrix basis for the wall animation or even using a single transfer matrix. We implemented our method in Unity using the high definition random pipeline. There, we used the rendering tools av already available to construct the database. The light mapper for surface transport and RTX implementation of volumetric and fiber to fiber transport for this later case. Our method only requires a small update at runtime on the standard shader. We show that our method permits to reconstruct indirect illumination with a varying quality depending on the number of bases. As you can see here, the reference is on the left and as we increase the number of bases, we get closer and closer to the target result. We validated that the transfer matrix does not impede the quality of reconstruction. In this graph, we compared the error of reconstruction using either our method or directly using uh, the basis and project uh, the indirect elimination inside it. Our method overhead compared to no GI at all is reasonable, but also that we are far from the cost of real-time pass tracing, even for low sampling budget. Here is a recorded result of an animated asset. On this asset, we have simulated volumetric light transport inside it. We do not rely on any BSSRDF approximation here and use full path tracing to evaluate the indirect illumination. Because there is no surface material here, we use a white lambertian material to capture direct illumination. In this example, we share both the basis and the transfer matrix for the whole animation. So the only source of variation across frames is because measurement points are attached to the geometry. Here is the asset in this animation. And here is the rendering of the measurement points. As you can see, they are attached to the geometry. And this is why the measurements vector is evolving, even though the light condition is not. This makes the reconstructed light map reflects the changes of incident illumination on the asset, on the different part of the asset. And using 64 basis vectors, we can reconstruct the following appearance, which follows the reference here on the right. Here is another result, this time for fiber to fiber scattering. For this asset, we had to generate a dedicated UV space to pack radiance on the fiber as 2D textures. Here is a rendering of the indirect component only, aside the reference, and combined 
with direct elimination. And the same rendering of indirect components only again. And with direct elimination. While we can handle a variety of things, our method knows some limitations. For example, we assume that the database corresponds to the light conditions encountered at runtime. If our method is used with light conditions outside of the dataset, the resulting indirect lighting will depart from the reference. We did not attempt to reconstruct rough appearances. While our formal formulation is not restricted to diffuse appearance, it would require more work to encode directionality in the database, for example using spherical harmonics. Also, our method is not well suited for baking indirect illumination in large assets. There, a modular approach like the one of Luce and colleagues would be required. That's it for our talk. As a summary, I presented a reformulation of pre-computed radiance transfer using a data-driven formalism. This allowed us to build a simple and efficient algorithm for real-time rendering of indirect illumination. We believe that it should be used as a baseline for neural network methods, since it permits to benchmark what improvements nonlinear function can bring. Thank you for watching. I'm sorry, Simon, I cannot hear you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. That fascinating talk. Um, we have time for questions, if anybody wants to add them to the question board. Um, in, the, in the meantime, um, in the paper, you say that you sample many random lighting configurations. I was just curious what many actually entailed exactly. Okay, so uh, in fact, for all of data sets, uh, I think we have something like uh, a thousand uh, of different configuration. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. But I mean, it's really not, technically we could go further, but uh, for the different cases we had, it was uh, sufficient. Okay. Uh, no questions there yet. Um so I was reading through the paper and I couldn't understand how you were doing the do the do the mapping, but from your talk, a, a, how you could actually determine given an arbitrary lighting direction or lighting configuration, how you get it. But I'm is it correct that you basically calculate the lighting at those given sample locations and then basically work out what the basis the, the weights for the basis are? Um, yes. So basically, you have the you have the uh, you you light uh, this fake G buffer, and it gives you a vector of basically values that determines whether uh, uh, a measurement point is lit or not, or mm -hmm. how much is it lit. And then this vector is multiplied by this transfer matrix, uh, which we bake uh, using mm -hmm. the data set, and it kind of map direct illumination to coefficients. Of mm -hmm. indirect illumination. So basically, you get another vector uh, which gives you um, how much of the different bases you have to take to reconstruct the indirect illumination given that you have this uh, direct uh, illumination vector. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, so, uh, we have a question. So, uh, what would it take to handle non diffuse cases? Uh, without going all the way to heavier, heavy specular cases. Okay, so very simply, like we said in the paper, um, basically, since everything is linear, uh, you could take uh, spherical harmonics coefficients, so you would need to actually bake uh, uh, a spherical diffusions uh, in your light maps, and you could basically uh, perform uh, uh, the SVD on it and get the basis that reconstruct the different uh, uh, SH coefficients uh, and then have the mapping from direct illumination to uh, SH coefficients uh, uh, and that should work. Uh, the question is how many basis elements you would need uh, to correctly reconstruct.
DSH uh, coefficient. That's uh, uh, a question we, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, but basically, that would be the easiest way to to handle the um, kind of like the rough cases uh, and not the specular one. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, so, I mean, I, I apologize. I, I've only read through the paper very, fairly briefly, but you were talking about keeping uh, RGB data. Is there any point in going to a different color basis? I mean, for example, YCOCG or anything like that? Uh, good question. Uh, so basically, um, what we do is we pre-compute a matrix, uh, a transfer matrix per color channel, mm -hmm. uh, so as to decouple them. Um, but um, you could take any uh, any color space from there. Uh, I'm assuming that it would be better to have a color space, uh, a correspondence between color spaces from the input and the output. So if your input if you want an output that is in a certain color space, then you'll have to, to get the input to be in the same color space. Or if there are nonlinearities transformation between those color spaces, then like the transfer matrix is not going to be able to correct for them. Uh, so uh, if you stay in the same color space, then you, you shade, you anchor that into a deep correct color space, you have your vector and then you apply matrix transform and then get your indirect elimination in a given color space, then decode this color space to be uh, the color space of your screens, for example, then you should be fine. Okay. Uh, we have one more question. Is the SH basis the only one to consider for non-diffuse cases? Um, so you could consider other, diff other cases, uh, I guess. Uh, the question is of good, it will map if you have, uh, if the space you use um, kind of represents nonlinearly the signal. For example, if you had, um, if, you, if you have a, um, a directional signal, if you represent by a directional signal, which uh, in, in which everything behaves linearly, uh, like for example the mean uh, of the distribution uh, or um, the variance of the distribution can be, or actually the standard deviation, uh, then you could map that uh, as. Uh, as parameters for a distribution to represent the exit in lighting, and that should work. Uh, if you have nonlinearities, then I mean, taking the least square regression is probably the not best uh, answer there. Uh, actually, um, in that case, I would probably opt to go for use, uh, a neural network method uh, in that case, because there you will be able to uh, uh, kind of handle the nonlinearity you. Uh, to the uh, spherical distribution you want to map. Okay. Uh, well, I think that um, brings us to the end of the, the time. Can we thank our speaker, or all our speakers again for their excellent presentations? And um, just like to do a, a quick introduction. Um, coming up next, my esteemed colleague, Andrew Garrard, will be instructing us on how to assemble the complementary Cornell box, uh, which all premium regist registrants will be getting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I hate public speaking, and I'm sure Jim did this just to torment me, but uh, I'm hoping speaking to a room full of people who know about geometry, you can work out how to slide together some flat pieces of wood. Uh, but the good news is that you need to use a hammer to get this to work. So there's a reasonable chance I'm going to injure myself. So you can all watch for that and it'll be a, a YouTube hit eventually, I'm sure. So uh, I'll show you how to put this together. And then uh, if we've still got time after I've tried to do that for a while, uh, I can show you what it looks like. Uh, so first of all, take your base. You can tell it's the base because it's got the logo on the back. Uh, and then pick some coloured sides. I'm going to choose red and green for semi-traditional reasons. Uh, you slide these in. IKEA would be proud of me. Um, in this manner, so the long arms slot together. And this is a slightly tight fit. 
Uh, so you should find they go all the way to the back. And there are matching slots at the end. I'm trusting you're all memorizing this for when you actually receive some. Uh, do the same thing again the other side. And then it gets slightly trickier. Uh, so we have a back face. The back face is like the bottom face and that it's got that on it, except it's a different shape. Uh, remember to put it in upright. Um, so you're sliding it in from above with the wider bits to the sides. And to do that, you need to make this bend out very slightly, which it just about will with its tolerance. And the trick is to make it line up with the slots, which you may or may not be able to see me trying to do from here. And with a bit of luck, it will go in. I've assembled this several times so far and I haven't snapped it yet, so fingers crossed. And right, we're kind of in. That's interesting. Ooh, right, so we are now four fifths done. Yes. Um, and finally, <laughs> it's amazing what you can get with board for your physical stuff is hard, I promise. Um, right, ceiling time. Uh, so the ceiling, unsurprisingly, slots in at the top. Uh, in a similar manner to the previous bits. I'm afraid there is just a hole. You'll have to work out how to do shining the light through it yourself, uh, but I can talk more about that in a second. Right, and you will find, due to the cunning design of the slot at the back, it doesn't go all the way in. This is where it gets interesting. Um, so what you need to do is to bend the top bit at the back enough that it will go over that ledge. Um, and the problem with that is that six mil plywood is hard, um, so you have to shove it quite hard. What you need to do is to get your fingers camera, um, right into the corners, uh, ideally not pressing on the weakened bit there, and try to bend it upwards. And this is where I go very red on camera, so let's see how long it takes me to manage to get this to work. Now I find the trick is to get it to go as far back as you can, and then ideally, if you can bend it enough, get the end of the back piece just to slot under the back. Uh, and at that point, we start injuring me. Um, so I recommend using a hammer with a softened bit on it, but um, this seems to be fairly solid wood, so hopefully it'll survive. So uh, let's see how the noise works in my acoustic system. Okay. That might not have fallen off yet, good. Uh, and in the interest of not snapping things, I recommend working it in from the sides. Anybody with headphones, I apologise. Uh, so it is sliding its way over the back slowly, and then we get a bit more exercise. And it hasn't broken, so yay. Um, right, and hopefully at this point it should all have slotted in and you'll have a Cornell box. Uh, and just to prove, <laughs> um, just to prove it works as a Cornell box and can of course shine the light in the top and see what you're doing. And it does need that slide around it. Um, so I have found that uh, using some kind of diffuser helps. Uh, the problem is that whatever would be the best diffuser probably depends on what light source you're using. Um, so we didn't provide one. Uh, you can do silly things with lasers and so on as well. Um, I will do a brief demonstration in a second. Um, I just also wanted to say, if you don't like the color, um, I did try wood staining them, but I'm very bad at wood stain, so you really don't want me to try, so I leave that as an exercise for the recipient. Um, but other colours are available if you are prepared to paint them yourself. So, uh, just to do the big reveal, uh, I have modern technology. Um, so, Cornell box in a dark room does indeed look kind of like a Cornell box. Uh, and just to prove it's the real one, 
if you shine the light on the front of it, uh, you can I'm going to turn my lighting down a little bit so that it's reflecting less. Um, uh, you can see that it's the real thing, and I even didn't break it. Uh, if you feel like going shopping for weird ornaments, you can kind of reproduce the real thing. Um, my Amazon search history is now going to have feng shui items in it. You're, you're welcome. Um, you can, if you're more into sports, consider golf balls, table tennis balls, um, squash balls. It was carefully chosen for that size. Uh, if you prefer geometric solids, then uh, geometric solids convenient for dealing with mappings are available. Uh, and if your geometric solids happen to come with illumination, then it looks quite pretty. Um, I'm obliged to point out that other sports are available and I'm the world number five in tiddlywings. So uh, that's my choice of how to present the thing. Um, and my excuse other than laziness for not including a proper filter at the top um, is that you can also shine lasers in the top. Um, if you do what I did and use a 200 milliwatt laser, what you can't do is look where you're aiming because you might take your eye out, but still. Um, so just to prove selection of lasers. Um, I did try participating media. Uh, I bought a little ultrasonic mister thing. Um, don't try that. It splashes water absolutely everywhere. Just if you're insisting on trying that experiment, I recommend the kettle. Um, but also not doing it on the hottest night of the year. Uh, it does also work as a desk tidy if you decide you don't actually want a Cornell box. Um, it's a little bit big, but there you go. Uh, and just in case you are historical and are concerned that green is the wrong colour, you also get a blue face. Six faces for the price of uh, five, let's say. So there's your collateral. Once I've managed to spray paint everything and the garden and myself, according to my experiments with the last one, um, I hope you enjoy them all. I will get them to you as soon as we can. <laughs> and um, hopefully faster than last year. Um, and I'll try to get some of them at least to the um, this place. Enjoy. Did you discuss how we're taking over from this gem you're coming in? <laughs> Hey, <laughs> that was that was so awesome, Andrew. Thank you so much. This was that was that was really great. <laughs> I it it looks really cool, but also the demonstration. I, I loved it. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be end of our stream, but not end of our a day for at HPG. We actually have a very very important event coming up. Our social event. Yes, so we're going to have our social mixer and OA. I presume that, you know, if you're not in OEA and you're watching one of the YouTube or Twitch streams, please jump in and, uh, and be here. If you're in the auditorium, uh, we're actually going to do a automatic shuffling of everyone and put, put everyone in some, some rooms. Uh, but if you're not, you know, you, you can, you can roam around that yeah, that's just going to be your starting room. Of course, you can switch to different rooms and see, see what other rooms are out there and which one you enjoy and. Uh, check out the puzzles as well. I think that that's going to be uh, interesting. You will see some interesting things to play with in the in the rooms, but mostly, mostly, we're here for the, the conversation uh, and just to chat and have a good time. Yeah. So thank you all for uh, joining HPG, and uh, well, I'll see you all in uh, in in I guess a few seconds whenever Nick clicks the button and sends us to, <laughs> to different rooms. Thank you. I think